Good evening and welcome everyone to the evening SMU joint session. In order to ensure that the program can be conducted smoothly without any technical interruption, we have muted everyone and the video has been disabled to save bandwidth. Uh, the speakers, however, are requested to unmute themselves and enable their video during their speech. This evening's webinar is brought to you by the Industry Connect Department of Sister Nivedita University and the Shivaning alumni. We are extremely happy to collaborate with British High Commission, Delhi British Deputy High Commission, Kolkata and Shivaning alumni for this event. You will hear about scholarships and fellowships and also uh, the need for the gender equality that is a priority for both the UK and India uh, during uh, the webinar. We will start the session with the introductory speech of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dhubajati Chattopadhyay. To give you a brief uh, introduction of Professor Chattopadhyay, he's a renowned academician with over 35 years of experience in the academic uh, sector. Uh, Professor Chattopadhyay uh, is right now the Vice Chancellor of Sister Nivedita University, uh, but uh, he was also the founder, Vice Chancellor of Amity University from 2015 to 2019. Professor Chattopadhyay was also the Dean, Faculty of Science at Calcutta University, and also the Pro Vice Chancellor of Calcutta University from 2008 to 2015, and also was the Director at the Center of Research in Nanoscience and Nanotechnology at uh, see you from 2007 till 2015. Professor Chattopadhyay has a research experience spanning more than 33 years. During his doctoral and postdoctoral research, he had visited numerous prestigious institutes in USA and uh, Japan as well. Uh, he's also recipient of numerous awards, accolades, and distinctions, including the Young Scientist Award in 1989, member of Guru Research Conference in 1992, Professor Uma Khan Sinha Memorial Award in 1992, Fellow of the National Academy of Science in 1998. Uh, the list is endless. Uh, he was also the Fellow of uh, Indian Academy of Sciences in 2004, Fellow of West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology in 2006, to name just a few. Professor Chattopadha has a lifetime membership in various organizations and uh, prestigious scientific associations like Indian Science Congress Association, member of the Asiatic Society, member of Biotechnology Society, member of Virological Society, and so on. Above all these, Professor Chattopadha is our most beloved, our favorite sir. Apart from empathic academic knowledge, he has mentored several students. He has touched and transformed lives of several of his students and helped innumerable young minds. Uh, he's here with us today. He will start the session today. Uh, Professor Chattopadhyay, our Honorable Vice Chancellor. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, Yohindrila. Um, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Let me at the onset uh, just like to thank the, um, the British High Commission, uh, New Delhi, as well as Kolkata the old uh, alumni of the Cliff Engine Scholarship and uh, our Industry Connect division, uh, particularly Madam Ina Boos and uh, the other team members. Now, this is one of the very important opportunity for our students. I just like that this, uh, the students should actually get to know about this scholarship uh, to enable the outstanding emerging leaders from all over the world to pursue the one year's master's degree in UK. Now, uh, we are actually trying to find out that if it is possible to get this type of students having passion with ideas and the solutions and leadership needed to create a better future, we'll definitely recommend them for actually trying for this 
challenging, challenging scholarship. Now, the other thing what is important over there that uh, I came to know that on completing of the studies, uh, the uh, EU, while leaving the UK, they can equip with the knowledge and networks necessary to bring the ideas of life and quite a bit of leadership qualities. With this, I just like to mention that today's seminar, which actually covers a very important point, uh, and uh, people are actually talking about this, and we are very happy that um, the head of the department of our sociology department, Professor Bula Bhadro, is going to be one of the speaker. Um, one of the speaker in this, and uh, it's it's very important to find out that this. Uh, today's program is going to be a very successful one where people will know about this particular important problem, the gender inequality, which is almost, uh, I can tell you that a huge amount of work is going on throughout the globe. Uh, wishing a great success for this webinar. I again congratulate all the organizers for allowing the SNU to host this particular very important webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start the program. Hello, hello. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, yes. um, Go ahead. Um, thank you, Ina Bose, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Drubajyoti Chattopadhyay, Vice Chancellor of the Sister Nivedita University. Um, the Chiefing Alumni India Kolkata Chapter, the CAI, is honored to collaborate with the Sister Nivedita University for this event today and support uh, with support of the British Deputy High Commission in Kolkata. A very good evening, friends, faculty members of the university, students, my evening colleagues, and everyone who is uh, online with us uh, today in this event. I am Varna Majumdar. I am a evening scholar and the chairperson of the Kolkata chapter of uh, CAI, representing the evening alumni in East and Northeast India. We have been um, organizing evening alumni engagement events in schools across West Bengal and Orissa, but this is the first time we are interacting with the university students. And we are really pleased to do this event at the Sister Nivedita University. We are also excited to engage with the young minds and the future leaders through this platform. I'm sure many of today's young participants and their friends will apply for the evening scholarships and fellowships this year or in the years to come. The evening scholars and fellows across the country have greatly benefited from the opportunity to study in the UK, which is otherwise a very um, expensive proposition for most Indians. We Chivners have met people from all over the world and developed expertise and knowledge in specific domains that have really, really contributed to our career growth. Chivning has in fact transformed our outlook leadership skills, and has helped us join a network of enormously influential people, both in India as well as abroad. After returning to India, the Chivning alumni become a living bridge between India and the UK. We contribute towards strengthening further the bilateral ties between the UK and India, and take forward the priority issues relevant to both the countries through various engagements and programs, just like you know we are doing in this event. So later in the program today, 
you will hear my co alumni talk on gender uh, equality which is one such very important priority area and now it's my proud privilege to introduce the head of evening india british high commission new delhi ms supriya chawla who has very kindly agreed to do a presentation today on evening scholarships and fellowships supriya thank you so much for your participation um the evening india network and the programs have uh, really grown over the years under your able leadership and um i must also mention the support of uh, ms ajita menon from the british uh, deputy high commission kolkata for the east and northeast india so with these words i would now like to hand it over to uh, uh, supriya for the presentation thank you so much supriya welcome thank you so much uh, barna and thank you for that lovely introduction of uh, of me and also for uh, evening i think you've just made my job a little easier uh, and um, and and i think we have grown in the last few years but i think a lot of credit also goes to all of our uh, brilliant uh, alumni uh, as well so um, it's it's uh, i'm really pleased today to be uh, part of this session particularly because it's got uh, two subjects that are really close to my heart uh, evening and uh, uh, gender equality Uh, and i think um, i must also thank um, uh, members of sister nivedita university for um, uh, for your interest uh, in and uh, in in organizing and participating in this um, in this session so um uh, i think i've been given a specified amount of time so and i have so much to say about uh, achieving so uh, i think i would it would be best if i work with the presentation and uh, my colleague rajul uh, is, is has promised to help me through uh, with with the with the presentation so um i think while i'm going to wait for him to start the presentation um uh, just a quick um a request if you have any questions just drop them into the chat box um uh, evening alumnus uh, arjun chatterjee has also promised to kind of help me out with uh, uh with the questions at the end of the session i've tried to kind of include uh, during the course of my session most of the commonly asked questions um so i'm i'm hoping that some of the questions will get answered as we go along um through the session so um right so uh, the the first slide is of course on 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 what these scholarships and and fellowships are um i think it's extremely important for me to tell you just take a few seconds and tell you at least about the history we began in 1983 when we started out uh, evening was offered in just about uh, uh, 40 countries uh, and um uh, and there were just 100 awards that were given out uh, today 37 years down uh, india alone is offering more awards than what was initially offered uh, we also started in the same year uh, 1983 so we were one of the first few countries where um, achievement began uh, today it's offered of course in 160 countries uh, and uh, in india we offer the largest achievement program in the world uh, sending almost um, uh, upwards of 110 scholars and fellows every year to the um, to the uk uh you will often use see me using two um uh, words scholarships and fellowships uh, and so i we've divided the presentation in such a way that uh, we first speak about scholarships and then we will move to um fellowships i think the audience today is very largely uh, we're looking at a very young um, uh, audience and uh, scholarships are awards that are given away for a one year masters um, a degree uh in any subject of your choice and in any uh, recognized university in the uk and we're talking really large numbers here so we're talking uh, about there are a few thousand courses that you could apply for and there are upwards of 150 universities in the uk that you could um apply in so it kind of works in in sync you apply for the evening award and uh, in the application you mention to uh, mention the three courses and three universities that you're interested in and alongside you also begin the process of um of applying to these universities to kind of uh, uh, get an offer from from them uh evening is the uh, uk government's flagship global award scheme and uh, and i think it's uh, a, a brilliant offer um and as we go along i will keep telling you more about uh, about it uh what are we looking for and who is it aimed at uh, it's uh, we're looking at people with leadership potential um i think it was it was stated early, earlier on uh, when, when we were opening the session that it is for leaders uh, and and for young leaders uh, uh, or for people who who are potential uh, leaders at the moment and will go on to become decision makers in um, in whatever field they are they are in and that's what we try and and um it, for for a want of a better word test to do when we have uh, you know when we ask you to to write your uh, answers your write your uh, application 
So um, Chevening scholars have done really well. Um, you will see some of them who will speak today uh, also later in the event. Uh, and they've gone on to rise, uh, they've risen to prominent positions um, in, in, in India and across the world as well. Um, so just moving on to the, uh, to, to the next slide, uh, who should apply for a Chevening scholarship? Well, there are just a few uh, asks. So you obviously have to be a citizen of India in this case. Uh, you should have completed your undergraduate degree. And so at the time of applying for uh, Chevening, your, your degree should be completed and you should have at least two years of work experience. Um, and uh, for those of you who are, are fresh graduates uh, today in the audience, uh, even if you've done voluntary work or you've done part-time work, uh, paid, unpaid internships, this work could have happened before your graduation, during your graduation, or even after your graduation. So I think this, it's, um, it's a wonderful window in which, uh, you know, which is, which is provided uh, that you can showcase uh, in terms of your work experience. Uh, and I think it, there is, there is a process in which um, uh, you know, we, we actually calculate the number of hours. Um, so we're looking at about 35 to 40 hours in a week and, and, uh, and across um, about 50 weeks or so uh, in the year. So I think it comes to about 2,800 uh, hours in the year. So obviously, if you're working part time, it will have to be over a few years that you can showcase uh, your work. And you should not have previously received a UK government funding to uh, study in the UK. That's, of course, very important. Um, so any other further eligibility criteria, I, just, uh, I think I just told you about it, that uh, at the time of applying, you, uh, you should obviously be quite clear in terms of what uh, you are looking for, uh, what you wish to study. And uh, so you have to list those choices. You may or may not um, uh, have those offers in hand when you apply. Uh, but the, we, we give you enough time, we give you almost about seven, eight months um, uh, after you've written your application to actually get uh, an offer from any of these universities. So there's plenty of time for you to kind of uh, uh, go through the entire process. Uh, the English language requirement, which was the IELTS or the TOEFL, uh, which used to be compulsory actually till last year, uh, is no longer, from this year onwards, there's, there's been a change of policy. So achieving is not going to require you to, to do an English language uh, testing, which I think is brilliant because uh, um, uh, I think in India, everybody does study um, uh, in, in, in English. And, uh, and I think we've never really had a situation where um, you know, people have got the achievement uh, scholarship and they've not been able to kind of clear the English language requirement test. The universities, however, may have, a, have, uh, may have that requirement. So um, you will have to fulfill that requirement of the university, uh, but, but uh, achievement does not require you to um, go in for the English testing anymore, which is, which is great news actually. Uh, so that is the, uh, and I will, talk a little bit more about the, uh, the scholarships also as we go along, but I'm now going to come to the, um, to the, to the fellowships. Um, uh, and so the fellowships actually are never too proud of this picture. It's got too many men in that, uh, in that picture. Um, but um, so, so fellowships are actually short term uh, thematic uh, courses, which are um, uh, eight to 12 week long. Uh, these are very unique to India, and we offer these to mid-career um, professionals um, who have a minimum of seven years of work experience. Uh, and uh, so in this particular case, actually, these programs, so these, seven, these eight to 12 week long programs are actually designed for these uh, eight to 12 um, fellows that we send to the UK. Uh, the sectors that have been chosen actually are um, mostly to do with our um, uh, with, with the kind of bilateral work that we that we do, and over the years these have these have changed. Um, so currently we have four uh, fellowships that are on offer. Uh, we've got um, a, a fellowship on science and innovation, research science and innovation. There is one on uh, cyber security. There is one on journalism, and of course there is one which is on leadership uh, and excellence. So. Um, so that's the, that's the list of the um, fellowships. I will just very quickly uh, take you through these um, uh, fellowships now. Uh, the Science and Innovation Fellowship runs at the University of Oxford at St. Cross College. It's a 10 week long program. And um, it's, it's really about the business of uh, innovation, innovation. And we've seen a, a large number of people who are, uh, who are researchers, who work in the space of science, uh, and also social sciences, uh, young entrepreneurs who've been on this uh, program. 
uh, and there's a wonderful group of people. We send about 12 uh, every year from India, and there are two people from Sri Lanka, two fellows from Sri Lanka who join, um, who are part of this uh, cohort. Uh, applications for uh, the fellowships are currently open. Um, the applications uh, opened on the 19th of August and they will remain open till 19th of October. So it's a two month long um, uh, window. Uh, so do encourage uh, friends, uh, colleagues who are interested in applying for CRIS. Uh, the next program um, is the program on uh, journalism. And I think we've had a large number of uh, uh, journalists um, um, who've been on this program, actually some of the leading journalists in India have been on this particular program. It's an eight week long program, which runs at the University of Westminster. And it's for uh, mid-career journal uh, journalists again, and the focus is good governance in a changing world, media politics and society. So when it began, this program was offered only to journalists from India and Pakistan. But over the years, we've kind of included uh, journalists also from Bangladesh, Maldives and Sri Lanka. So it's a it's a, it's a brilliant set of um, uh, uh, journalists. They, the 17 of these journalists, actually, there are seven from India, seven from Pakistan, and one each from uh, Bangladesh, Maldives, and Sri Lanka. All 17 of them uh, stay together for those eight weeks. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's, uh, uh, we've had some amazing uh, examples of people um, who worked across uh, uh, borders, even after they've, they've come back, you know, they kind of stay connected on WhatsApp. Uh, if there are breaking news, they, they cross check with each other. And uh, may, we've had many instances when, um, when the news has broken, uh, for example, in Pakistan and, 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 and the uh, SAJP journalists have checked with their counterparts and uh, it turned out to be fake and they didn't report it uh, while some other channels did. And then they had to apologize for, for news. So I think it's, uh, it's just, so this particular program is also brilliant. Uh, I've already mentioned we, we, got, we choose about seven journalists uh, from India. And um, once again, applications are open for all fellowships uh, in, uh, for the dates that um, are appearing at the um, uh, bottom of the slide. Uh, and the course, this particular course will begin in March uh, next year. Um, and the previous one, Chris, would, would, would be beginning in uh, May. Uh, the third fellowship, which is open at the moment, is the fellowship on uh, cyber security. Uh, it, it is a 10 week long program at the Defense Academy in Cranfield uh, University. Uh, very popular with our defense service officers, with the CBI, with the, with the, with the police officers, um, and, and of course with the industry, uh, the lawyers. Um, and, and I think we've uh, Excellent work is, is, is happening not just in the uh, in the policy space of cyber security in, in India, uh, because we've had some, uh, some really brilliant people who've gone on this um, program uh, as well. And um, uh, the course will commence again in, in March uh, next year. So if you do have any friends in the space of cyber security um, who are working on crime prevention, um, uh, commercial opportunities and national security, uh, please encourage them to apply for this 10 uh, week long uh, program and once again, remember these are thematic programs. They're especially designed uh, for these uh, for uh, for the fellows that we send out. They will send out six cybersecurity uh, fellows uh, for the program. It's a it's a mix of the kind of uh, in the, the way the program is designed actually. So we've got classroom sessions. We've got uh, loads of networking opportunities. There are field visits. Uh, there are individual projects. There is mentorship provided by the universities. So it's like uh, so we keep it in mind that this is for mid-career professionals. So they're designed in a manner in which um, uh, you know there is a lot of scope for uh, meeting the decision makers and opinion formers uh, in the UK. Uh, and and for for the for the members of, uh, uh, of of UK to kind of meet with some of the leaders of India, so I think it's just really collaborative and it's um, it's, it's a wonderful experience. The uh, fellowships. We've got one more fellowship, uh, which is the fellowship on uh, leadership and excellence, which is um, called also called Gurukul. Uh, also runs at Oxford. We choose twelve um, fellows from India for this particular program. Uh, uh, this is a beautiful program. Has been running for uh, twenty three years now in India and. Um, so it's, this is interesting in the sense that we have people from all kinds of backgrounds uh, who, uh, who go for Gurukul because the program is on leadership and there's a lot of learning from within the peer group. So we've got people, uh, you know, you could, you could be sitting, a journalist could be sitting next to a wildlife conservationist who could be sitting next to a, 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 to, to a policymaker uh, or, or a bureaucrat. So the, so the peer group is, is, is brilliant and there's a lot of learning from, uh, from amongst um, each other. This application is currently not open. This program begins only in September, uh, a little later in the year. So the application will open in January. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sure there are, there are uh, quite a few members in the audience here uh, today who would 
definitely be interested either themselves or they could push the um, this particular program to um, to just about anybody actually like I said because there is no it's not sectoral per se. Uh, so uh, the next slide is an uh, important question of what does the scholarship and the fellowship uh, cover? Uh, like I said, it's an extremely generous uh, offer and one of the few uh, scholarships that actually um, is so generous, if I can say that again. Uh, it covers your tuition fee entirely, uh, your living allowance, um, your economy return flight to the UK, uh, and uh, also there is uh, a, a, you know, a, a daily allowance. Uh, and of course, your visa fee. There are uh, scholars that I have known um, who, you know, if you if you're gonna keep a budget and if you spend well, uh, you can actually save. And many of them actually travel around the UK uh, with with the stipend money that is given to them. So it's uh, it's it's just really really brilliant. And um, uh, the only um, program for which there is a fee cap uh, is the MBA program. Uh, where we the evening only pays about eighteen thousand um, pounds, and the rest has to be spent by the um, by the scholar. Uh, and remember, these are all uh, nine to twelve week long programs. So this is for a one year master's um, a program. And uh, while the while for fellowships, uh, like I said, they are short short term courses. But we this, all of this is covered in the uh, for, for the fellows as well. So it's fully funded, and uh, nothing has to be spent by the scholars and the and the fellows. Um, what does it offer? Um, so I think we, we spoke about the networking um, uh, aspect of it. Uh, there are there are about 50,000 uh, alumni across the world who have been on the achieving programs. There are about 3,300 uh, alumni uh, in, in India. And um, uh, so it's this, it's this brilliant, uh, uh, very vibrant, uh, dynamic network of people uh, that is offered to you literally on a platter uh, if you are a part of this program. And uh, it's so there are these platforms, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, or even platforms like Chevening Connect, which which help you connect with uh, people who you know like-minded people who are probably working in uh, in your sector uh, across the world. So if you if you're working in any space, uh, for example, if you're working in gender equality, um, since we people follow it up with the discussion on that, so you can actually look at what is happening across um, uh, uh, globally, what your Chevening um, um, uh, fellows and scholars are actually doing in other parts of the world, and you can. You can you can collaborate and, and um, uh, you know kind of work together. So I think it's um, it's it's a brilliant um, platform. Um, so uh, the application dates actually we've discussed as we kind of went along, but uh, the scholarships will open next week. Um, fellowships are already open, like I said. Scholarships will open next week. It'll stay open for a couple of months again. Uh, we just recently, a couple of days ago, we just uh, had a pre-departure for the scholars who were uh, selected um, for for this particular year, who and they're starting the program uh, in 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 a month's time or so. Uh, it's extremely excited, enthusiastic bunch of people who are uh, who just can't wait to get to the UK. Um, so we just spoke with them and 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 really fingers crossed, and we are really thankful that despite uh, the pandemic, um, things have opened up now, uh, and the universities are um, are kind of welcoming uh, all of the students uh, into. Um, uh, into the UK for for them to actually start their programs uh, on campus. So that's that's great news um, uh, for us as well. Uh, the, the, do keep an eye out on the uh, website. It's a www.chevening.org. It was there on the previous slide. Yeah. So uh, that's where you will get more information on Chevening if if you want more uh, information. Um, we're moving towards the last few slides now. Just, I think, very important uh, request that came to us was in terms of how do we apply for uh, the application. So normally, we normally did cover this in the past uh, in our um, uh, presentation, but I think it's extremely important because we want the best from you. So I think it, it makes perfect sense to tell you uh, what the application actually looks like. So we look at four, uh, other than you know your, your other details and your work experience, et cetera, there are four um, uh, questions. Um, uh, one is on leadership and influencing. Uh, the program is for potential leaders. The program is for leaders, uh, uh, you know, who will come back and, and become leaders in their uh, in their country. So the um, this question is extremely important, and I would suggest that all of you, you know, when you apply, uh, just spend sufficient time on on doing your applications. Uh, that's because these questions are important. Give clear examples of a time when you've used um, uh, leadership and influencing um, uh, skills. Uh, so let that come across to us on, on how you have been a leader, um, uh, you know, uh, even even while growing up or uh, in, in the work that you may have done or in, in, in your uh, um, 
you know, the years that you've been studying. Uh, networking is another important aspect. Like I said, we have this wonderful platform that we present to you. So networking obviously becomes a very uh, important uh, aspect. Um, uh, so we need to know that you are great at networking. Give us good examples again in your networking questions of how you used your networks to ac accomplish things probably which would have otherwise been quite challenging. The, uh, the next two set of questions are on the um, a study in the UK. You've chosen some courses, you've chosen some universities, you have to tell us why, you have to convince us that those courses are uh, what you wish to do and how those will help you achieve your career goals. And the last question is, of course, on the career plan where you, uh, you have to, that's where we actually see the passion, uh, which is extremely important and how you will translate, uh, you know, when, after you, you, you've studied in the UK, how will you bring that back, that learning back and then use it to achieve your, um, your career goals and, and make uh, um, you know, a mark in uh, your country, home country as well. So that's the, um, the application process. And um, so, yeah, I think we've kind of already um, uh, covered the alumni community of these wonderful uh, set of people. Uh, and, and, and the benefits, of course, is you get access to uh, the who's who. You get a lot of networking opportunities when you are in the UK. Um, and, and I think we do have a slide also to let you know um, who are the, uh, some of our best, uh, not really the best, I wouldn't say the best, but some of um, our uh, alumni who are doing amazing work um, in uh, the country who are a notable achieving alumni. So uh, cabinet ministers, lots of people who are uh, at the helm of the, uh, whether it's the in industry sector or the government, or we, for example, the CEO of Niti Aayog, Amitabh Kant is, is the chief name scholar, uh, uh, one of the leading think tanks, uh, ORF, the Observer Research Foundation, Sami Saran is, uh, is the chief name uh, scholar, Rahul Kaval is the, um, uh, the um, uh, is from, is, 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 is a leading name in the media uh, space, and he's he's achieving scholars. So, um, so those is those are the kind of um, people who've been on achieving um, um, scholarships, and uh, and you will get access, like I said, on uh, to a common. Uh, are really helpful in the reach out to each other and kind of really help uh, each other throughout as well. So I think that's about um, about it. These are our handles for social media. So, um, so, so, so just stay connected, start looking up these things for, for more information. As we get information, we keep kind of posting them on our, uh, on our pages. Uh, so, so, so do be on the lookout um, for that. And um, Arjun, thank you so much uh, and hello. And uh, thank you for uh, helping me out with the questions. So um, over to you, Arjun. Arjun is a Chevening alumnus and we're really proud of him. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. Uh, one thing that I would tell the students is that there are a lot of students here listening to your presentation and here in this evening. Uh, you know, four years back, I was sitting on the other side of the table and Supriya was interviewing me as one of the aspirants. And I'm here hosting a show, moderating the fantastic uh, guests today evening. If you can't ask questions, you will be lagging behind. So let's put up those questions right up front. And uh, this is the opportunity. We never had once. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether we were fortunate or unfortunate, but due to COVID times, we are all online. We have this opportunity to shoot questions to Supriya. So before students start thinking, uh, Supriya, we have one question, which is how does achieving help in getting jobs? Well, okay, I'll pass it on to you. How can students receive help for visa? Uh, so um, I think jobs, um, uh, jobs mostly work through networks, uh, at least uh, in, in India, that's, that's how they work. And I think they work like that across the world as well. So uh, I think what we've been doing, in fact, a lot of uh, scholars who are currently in the UK, uh, just to give you an example, which is very um, uh, recent, uh, they have been writing to me and they've been requesting that I connect them with the achieving network that is already present uh, present in our uh, in our country and I've, and I've done I've made some connections and there are some people who've actually managed to um, uh, you know impress uh, some of our uh, uh, older um, uh, achieving scholars and fellows the alumni and uh, and I think there is there has been um, um, they, they are already in the process of discussing work etc. So I think the achieving network in itself, there's 3,300 uh, people that we have, uh, that is by itself a space where, um, you know, you 
uh, jobs will become easier because you will be you will be speaking to them and uh, and i think arjun will also uh, agree with me that i think achieving um, uh, scholars when the young achieving scholars actually reach out uh, i think uh, everybody um, who's 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 in the larger family helps out reaches out and helps out uh, as well i'm sure i mean there are friends in 140 countries and they're posting jobs within the chevni alumni network and that is by itself another parallel to linkedin or any other social networking site and you know you get to meet some of the finest minds some of the finest brains who have been able to achieve what they have so that's a huge bonus for chevni scholars apart from that yes as supriya pointed out you save a lot you travel a lot you study a lot you get access to library facilities and i think it is transformatory supriya if you could just throw some light on post pandemic times because many are speculating on whether to apply and how things might pan out once we get into better days so as you like i said we've just recently done a pre departure and this is uh, when we are still in the middle of the uh, the, the pandemic uh, the universities are operational uh, they they are already welcoming uh, our um, scholars these are people who applied last year and um, and uh, so 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 uh, i mean so they are heading out so if you do apply in the next year it's only going to be that much better i'm sure uh, you know by, by then we will be covid immune for sure um and i think jobs uh, at the moment yes i understand in terms of there is there is a bit of a recession that is that is likely to hit uh, to hit everyone um and that is why the network becomes that much more um, uh, important uh, as well uh, and there are certain sectors that are doing amazingly well actually uh, so it's it's not as if there is uh, the the recession has hit all sectors whatsoever i mean we recently we had uh, achieving um, uh, a fellow who's who's working in the space of education and he's he he wants 100 people actually to join um, as as um, as as teachers and you know and as professors in in his in, in the university that they're just starting out so there is uh, in the digital space for example the world is opened out uh, as well so um, yeah i think the connect with the chevening will definitely be very very helpful and that's what we would do in the in the um, that's what we are trying to help our um, scholars so coming back i think I, i'm sure you have clarified this before but one more time because a few questions have come up asking whether you need to spend a lot of money to apply for the scholarship you don't i mean but I'll let them hear it from you because oh, whether you need a lot of money to apply for the scholarship somebody oh, has no. posted a question uh i think financial financially they're not yeah. stable enough. no how do kind of overcome that problem while applying for the scholarship yeah thanks sir uh, arjun uh, no not at all actually it's an online application it's free um, you don't have you don't uh, we don't it doesn't cost you a penny actually to apply for the uh, for the applica- for the uh, to apply for chevening uh, and also like i said the offer is really generous so all your tuition fee your travel your uh, daily allowances your accommodation uh, your visa fee everything is taken care of including your medical um, uh, insurance uh, and it just kind of looks after the medical insurance so all of that actually is 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 covered by chevening so no expenses at all um, uh, to be paid by the scholar uh, that is if you keep yourself in the budget of course um, absolutely and It, it's a pretty decent budget. I mean, I could travel to Ben Nevis as well. So, if you can justify your expenses, you can find ample time to study and focus on the subject that you go there to study. Yeah. What it also does, it opens up avenues to interact with representatives from other countries. So, Pia, can you please share with them how it is, how it feels to prick that bubble where they, we all are in, and suddenly get emancipated in a world which makes you more open. more prone to interactions from different corners of the globe yeah so so i think within the chevening space of course when you when you go to the uk uh, it's it's it just uh, it's it's a whole new world of uh, of of people from all uh, very diverse backgrounds diverse uh, nationalities but i think within the chevening space uh, also i think we are um, um, we provide this platform so there are at the time that you will be studying if you are selected um, uh, and you will be studying in the uk there will be about 1700 scholars from across about 160 countries who will also be there who are part of the chevening program and uh, the chevening secretary in london who helps uh, administer this program for us Uh, they organize a large number of events in fact i think every fortnight there is an event where uh, they try and bring in chevening um, um, scholars together and uh, so you choose what is uh, of your interest and you participate i think they give you opportunities to create things of your interest as well so if you uh, for example if you are interested in a certain craft or in a particular uh, aspect you can actually create your own programs and bring other people onto uh, this platform and so this is ample opportunity to interact and i think chevening makes it that much more easier because it gives you this ready made platform to kind of um, yeah, interact with these people from 160 countries in any case other than of course what the university does yes. 
I think the dilemma that students face uh, is, should I apply for the scholarship first or should I apply for the universities first? So if you can address that query. Yeah, so, uh, so actually at the time of the application, what we want from you is we of course want clarity in the sense of what you wish to do and what you wish to study. So uh, at the time of the application, you need to list at least those three courses and those three universities uh, uh, where you wish to study. Um, because that is what your answers will be based on. I mean, you wouldn't be able to put together a study in the UK or a career plan uh, for us if you've not defined that at least. But like I said, there are about six, seven months after you've written your application for you to get that offer, an unconditional offer from the university uh, uh, as well. So yeah, so it, it, it's the application first, but clarity in your head about what you want to study and then you follow it up by uh, applying to the universities. Uh, there's a question for fresh graduates. What volunteer work can count as work experience? What kind of proof of work would the interview panel look for? Uh, so proof of work, actually, it's why we don't ask you for hardcore proof of work. Uh, you have to list all of your, uh, your work experience. Uh, you have to provide uh, the, the name of the organization, the people that you worked with, the addresses, etc. Uh, and you have to give us, and that is where the, the reference letter comes in. So we will ask you for reference uh, letters. Um, so that's that's how we we um, uh, uh, they will they they are, there could be checks um, they may not necessarily be checks at, in all the places of work that you've done but they could be uh, random checks that are uh, that are done which are I think normal procedure across uh, uh, when you apply for anything um, uh, I suppose so yeah that's that's what we don't need certificates from you we just need a list and uh, and reference letters from uh, eventually um, from a couple of people. Super, could you just also tell them once they submit the online application form. What are they expecting? They, they get a mail that their online application has been registered or they have submitted it. What next? Uh, so I'll just take you through the timeline. Uh, so you, uh, the, the application is open from 3rd September to 3rd November. Um, so after you applied, it's a, it's a bit of a wait. I mean, you have to wait. Uh, it's, so it's only around the um, uh, around March and April is when we start to interview you. So about, about February or so is when you will hear about whether you are in, your application has been shortlisted and you will be uh, appearing for an interview or not. So that's that's it. It's just the application and then there is an interview. These are the two um, um, processes uh, where, we, um, where we interact with you. I mean, one is through an application and the other is through an interview. Uh, interviews are held across, um, I think that we interview for about 20 odd days. So two months, March and April is the time given to us. Uh, then you hear the result in the month of June, actually on the first week of June is when you hear the outcome. Uh, you have till July, even after you hear the results, you have till July to get your unconditional offers from the universities. Uh, and, and, and so that's why we finalize, uh, the final list is then drawn in July, but you will get to hear about your admissions, uh, your scholarships uh, in June from us. So I hope that was, that's the time uh, line. Right. Even though this is online, I, I presume most of the, most among the audience are somewhere in or around Calcutta, Kolkata. So... Uh, would that be a problem for outstation students if they're called for the interview or interviews happen in different cities in India? If you can just kindly elaborate. Uh, yeah, so interviews will happen. They happen in uh, six cities now in India. Um, we try not bring our uh, scholars to, uh, to Delhi, though the fellowship interviews are actually held in, in Delhi, but those are for mid-career professionals. And I think half the time, I've, you know, there is some work or the other which uh, you know, our fellows kind of plan and then they, uh, they come for the interview. But scholars, we understand they're younger um, um, set of people, they're young professionals, and uh, we don't want to, uh, we want, don't want them to travel. So we've got uh, into centers in Kolkata, in uh, Bangalore, Chennai, Mumbai, uh, Hyderabad, uh, and in Delhi. So there are these six cities where interviews uh, happen. So you choose whichever city is closest to you. Regarding subjects, are there subjects that I mean, there's a list of subjects that change every year, or can anybody just from any background apply for the Chievening Scholarship? I'm getting questions on WhatsApp also. Yeah. So subjects actually, um, <clears throat> there are over a few thousand subjects that you can choose from. Some of them are really, really, um, um, uh, you know, the super specialized kind of uh, subjects as well. And so there is, if you go onto the website, you will have, there is a complete drop down of, of uh, universities of the subjects that are available to you. But having said that, uh, there have been lots of instances where, uh, you know, you may like a, a, to study a particular subject, a particular course, and it may not be available. Uh, so, uh, you, so if you write to us, uh, we actually try and make sure that we incorporate that um, uh, into, into our drop down uh, list, actually. So we're quite flexible in terms of we want people to study what they wish to study, actually, because that's the only way uh, you, you take your passion forward. 
So don't worry about the subjects at all. I mean, if, if, it, if it is in a recognized university, we try and make, uh, make it possible that, um, that you can um, study it. There's a question. Universities usually want proof of language proficiency, but because of the pandemic, the tests are not being conducted. Can you help with that? Uh, but what tests? I, are I think uh, language proficiency, but ah. you know, in any case, you have to take the IELTS or the TOEFL, but uh, because we are having problems with the university examinations. So will that be a problem, particularly this year for applicants? So um, uh, last year, uh, what happened was that because of the pandemic, a large number of the English testing centers were closed and, uh, and, and most of the universities, so Chiefening had, in any case, had, uh, we, we told our scholars that we don't need you to take the testing. Uh, if, of course, now the policy has changed and we are not requiring these students to take the testing at all. But even the universities actually made a lot of exceptions uh, and uh, I think they were, uh, they were completely on board with students not taking the, uh, the testing and coming to the, to the universities without these tests this year. And, and likewise, uh, we don't know how the situation will play out, but in the future, if, if this is the situation that will remain, uh, then I'm sure even the universities will make uh, amends next year as well and, and will we'll do away with the te English testing uh, as much as possible. So I think we are more or less done, but I would still ask you to share some experience of students. You know a lot of them. You know us. Uh, what's life like once you're there? And I can go on hours talking about this to them, but they should hear this from you. So uh, I think it's, it's uh, what we want you to do, actually. And I think most of these scholars end up doing that is uh, uh, while you're here, because it's a one year master's program, obviously, it's going to be really, really uh, intensive. Uh, and, uh, and, it's, uh, and you have to study a lot, obviously. But um, uh, take your weekends off uh, and really experience uh, uh, the UK culture. I think there is so much to do. And I think uh, some, of the, some of the brightest stories and the most brilliant stories come from uh, some of their travel experiences. Uh, there are programs in which you can actually go and live with families, um, the British families, and, and I think that experience is of a different kind yeah, altogether. So there's a lot of the host. Yeah. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yes, the host families, and then there is of course the uh, lots of voluntary opportunities for you. Um, you are allowed to also work for a few hours uh, in the week, but that um, uh, that is um, uh, besides that, there is a voluntary experience that um, that you can um, uh, you can take on. You can work in any field that is of interest to you, whether it's with children or with the environment or, um, uh, you know, in the space of um, uh, um, gardening or whatever it is that excites you. Actually, you can, you can, an art and culture. So you can do voluntary work. Um, I think some of our Indian scholars have been doing, uh, they've clocked the maximum number of voluntary uh, hours as well. So I think the whole experience, and there are some brilliant pictures that people share with us, our scholars in the UK, and, uh, and I love the fun pictures. Uh, uh, we don't want to see them studying in the, in the classrooms uh, because we know they're doing that in any case. But I think the amount of fun they have um, uh, is, is, just, is just wonderful. So, so it's taken the whole culture experience. This entire year should not just be about the studies. It should be about you know, experiencing the UK as a whole, really, and make lots of friends, network, um, uh, and, 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 and kind of, you know, um, just go out there and, and, and have, have fun and meet lots of people. Also a quick question, can they work while they study? Uh, yes, so there are allowed a few hours of work. Um, um, uh, that's, that's those are internships that they are allowed, uh, but it has, to, it has to fall within. So they have to have permissions from their universities uh, and the achievement requires them to only work for a, for a certain number of hours in the week. So they are allowed to um, uh, work, yes. Right, so. I, I guess uh, one of our fellow Chiefing scholars, Navajit, has posted something. If the medium of English at undergrads level is English, then you need not. I don't think that's, that's partially correct, right? Uh, if the medium of uh, education at undergrads is English, you still have to in certain universities. Yes, you still have to, um, because I think there are some countries who have, um, uh, where you don't, you don't need it. But India is uh, unfortunately not one of those countries at the moment, at least. So the universities will ask you to take the uh, testing. Some universities uh, uh, do provide you the, uh, I mean, if you tell them that you said it in English, some universities do make an exception and they say, all right, fine. We don't need the English testing uh, from you. Uh, Arjun, there was a question on visa actually. So I think uh, we've not experienced any situation so far where achieving scholar has been uh, refused a visa. Uh, I think this was one of your first questions that you've taken yeah. on. Um, and in any case, I think 96% of, uh, of the people who apply for um, achieving uh, for, for, for studying in the UK, actually, 96% of the people in any case get their visas. And Chevening, I think we've, we've always had a 100% score uh, um, for Chevening. 
Yeah, I think we have a ministry level bilateral ties which promote academic exchange between the two nations. We are into the last leg, last two couple of minutes. Your thoughts, Supriya, and your final words to the students. I, th I think there's a lot of them here listening to you. Uh, so I think my uh, last thoughts would really be that if, if you are bright and if you are, um, uh, if you think you have it in you and you have a passion, uh, please don't shy away from applying. I think a lot of us uh, constantly think that it's not for me, it's too prestigious and, uh, and we just don't even try actually. So I think this is a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity that we are able to speak with you uh, through this medium uh, today. Um, in the past few years now, we've had a lot of first generation uh, people who've actually applied and who've got the um, uh, scholarships. We've had, um, uh, uh, you know, people who've, um, who, who, who never thought actually that they, that they, would, they would get the scholarship. So those have been inspirational stories and we've written about those stories uh, and we hope some of you may have read those stories as well. So apply, uh, applications will open next week and spread the word out and, uh, and really make your dreams come true. Uh, this is such a wonderful offer really. Thank you so much. I leave one minute for the SNU faculty members in case we have very revered faculty members there in case anyone has a question. Uh, shall I wait? I think no. We have the, in the chat box for the audience, the web link is mentioned. Kindly have a look at that. Thank you, Supriya, once again for that fantastic presentation. And I will now thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. I now slip into the next part of today's evening, where we invite Ms. Sophie Ross, Deputy Head of Political and Bilateral Affairs, British High Commission, New Delhi. Uh, Sophie is going to speak to you on gender and diplomacy. And uh, I think in the virtual online medium, you know, you don't take we don't need much time to invite our next guest. So let me welcome Ms. Sophie Ross. Hi there, thanks so much for the uh, introduction and good evening everyone. Um, I'm delighted to join you at this um, event today, I'm joining you from Delhi. Um, and thank you to the Vice Chancellor and all the faculty at uh, SNU for hosting this event. Um, I was in uh, Kolkata uh, with uh, Ajuta, my colleague, at the end of last year, and I was hoping to be back this year, but obviously that will, um, that will have to wait uh, for a bit now in light of the situation. Um, but I would echo my, uh, my colleague Supriya's words on the achieving programmes. They are fantastic opportunities. They're, they're open to people of all backgrounds and all genders. Um, speaking of gender equality, um, so please do apply. Um, and I feel quite jealous thinking about studying in the UK again. Uh, so... <laughs> Enjoy it. Um, so by way of introduction, I lead on uh, human rights policy and projects, as well as Indian politics um, at the British High Commission in Delhi. Um, and that includes um, gender equality. So I was delighted to learn that this panel was going on, um, as this is a cause uh, close to my heart, as well as being um, a core part of my job here in India. Um, so um, when it comes to gender and diplomacy, which I was asked to speak about, um, it's very much an evolving story um, and I was only uh, given a few minutes to speak um, and I don't want to take up uh, valuable time for the very interesting panel discussion that's coming. Um, so I will just give you a few um, nuggets to think about, food for thought perhaps, um, which I think apply to the wider theme of gender equality in professional and social life, which I understand um, the panel will be discussing. So the first is about perceptions, um, apart from anything else, um, and what you imagine um, when you think of a diplomat. So people still refer to ambassadors as our man in Delhi, Washington, or anywhere else. Um, and that obviously points to some long-standing gender perceptions about diplomats. And as a young woman diplomat, um, I frequently find myself at events in Delhi, um, or all over India with guests from all over the world who will ask me, um, what does your husband do at the British High Commission? And I have to correct their biases and explain that in fact that I am a diplomat and my husband uh, does not work for the British government at all. And I'm not sure whether any of you have read the fantastic book, um, Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Um, well, I fully recommend it. Um, it's a very rigorous analysis of how everything in our world, from city plans to crash dummies in cars to musical instruments, are modelled on the average man. Um, and evidence suggests if you ask someone to draw, for example, a doctor, they'll most likely draw a man. 
and diplomats are no different in that regard. So the first message I wanted to deliver is that gender perceptions exist, but realities are changing globally across different sectors because you get diplomats like me, for example, and role models and mentoring, I think are crucial to breaking that cycle. And I'm sure the panel might consider that today. And secondly, on a basic level, the role of a diplomat is to represent their country, as you'll all know. Um, and given women make up half the population in the UK, we need female diplomats for the diplomatic service to be reflective of the UK population. Indeed, today our man in Washington is actually a woman. So the ambassador from the UK to the USA is a woman for the first time in history. Her name's Karen Pierce, and she holds the most senior role in our diplomatic service. But we're also moving away from the model of diplomats all being the same. And we're thinking about what aspects of our identity can we bring to our roles? Part of being a diplomat is now about being an authentic leader. So what's different about us that we can leverage to the benefit of our jobs? There are different skill sets which female diplomats can bring to their roles abroad. And being a woman in some country contexts can be a benefit. And I think the same can be said for other professional contexts. So my second message is I think we need to start seeing diversity and authenticity in leadership as a strength. And maybe our panelists will touch on that in their various sectors as well. And finally, increasingly, gender equality is central to our foreign policy. We simply can't achieve our global objectives without it. Gender inequality is holding countries back. It's preventing economic and social developments. It's evidence that a gender inclusive policy approach can help drive increased peace and stability, economic growth and poverty reduction. And that's especially relevant as we build back better after COVID-19. And in India, we, the UK government, um, we're doing all sorts of things to promote gender equality. We're partnering with state governments, with education authorities, with British businesses, with civil society, as part of the UK's policy and programmes globally to empower women and girls. Um, to give you a flavour of our work very quickly, we're building better and more economic opportunities for women in India. We're promoting girls' education and positive gender roles in schools. We're boosting climate resilience among women in rural communities and we're tackling gender-based violence and human trafficking, all hugely important issues that we're proud to work with Indian partners on. And as this is a achievement event, um, I wanted to actually link the gender equality bit with the achievement bits um, and highlight how we're empowering women as leaders all over the world through our achievement fellowships um, and to be innovators in male-dominated sectors like cybersecurity and financial services. Um, for example, 70% of our cohort last year of the Achieving Science and, and Achieving Science and Innovation Fellowship um, for India program um, were women, which is fantastic. And today I wanted to plug that we just launched our fourth annual campaign for the International Day of the Girl, where we host a competition for an Indian young woman to become High Commissioner for the day. Um, so there may well be some of you in the audience who um, this is relevant for, it's open to young women between 18 and 23. Um, so if you're eligible, please look up UK in India on uh, social media platforms um, and do get involved. And very finally, I'm now leading our work to ensure that all our programmes and policies in India are gender sensitive, regardless of the topic. Looking at how we can lead by example, champion gender equality in the workplace and beyond, and make the British High Commission, which has 1,000 staff across India, a great place for people of all genders to work. And concrete actions we might take include gender inclusion training for all staff and ensuring that the panels we host and participate in are gender balanced without being tokenistic. So my final message is that that type of work, it's not specific to my professional or social context. Every organization globally um, needs to consider how to become truly diverse and inclusive, both in terms of their staff and corporate practices but also their external facing work and the programmes they support. And equally, we as individuals, whoever we are, we should also consider how we can take on responsibility to correct our own gender biases and to promote positive gender norms in our lives. So I hope that was an interesting insight into gender equality in my life as a diplomat 
and I'm really looking forward to hearing from the esteemed panel on the same topic. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. That was fascinating. In fact, you have opened the floor for the discussion to proceed. But before we proceed, there's a question from one of the eminent panelists in the chat box. Dr. Bulab Hadra has asked, which state governments you work with? Kindly name some of the projects, if you may reply to that question. Yeah, sure. Thank you for, um, for the question. Um, well, we work with nearly all um, state governments in India on all sorts of different topics. Um, as we'll know from the Deputy High Commission in Kolkata. We have seven Deputy High Commissions across the country. Um, India is our largest overseas network in the world, um, which we're very proud of. Um, and so um, really we partner with, um, with state governments all over on a huge number of different issues, whether that be on trade, whether that be on education, on all sorts of issues. Um, and that also goes um, for our work on gender. Um, so in all sorts of places all over India, um, and I'm sure um, Ajita, another time, would love to um, brief you on some of the work we've done um, with West Bengal and other states in um, Northeast India as well. Thank you. Uh, that was a lovely presentation, Sophie. I hope you can stay on for the rest of the discussion. And let me now take time to introduce the eminent panelists we have today evening. We have Dr. Bula Bhadra, uh, eminent scholar, Professor and Head of the Department of Sociology, Sister Nivedita University, and Regional Representative of South Asia, Research Committee on Gender, Women, and Society. She has been with the University of Calcutta for a long, long time, and many students of sociology know her personally, and she has mentored them. Next, uh, we have Professor Ruchira Goswami, uh, my senior in the scholarship, uh, fellow achieving scholar, and Assistant Professor of Sociology, National University of Sciences, Calcutta. Uh, Ruchira, the welcome. And I have the third panelist, Mr. K. Bala Murugan. He's also a fellow achieving scholar and the director of conservator of forests, directorate of forest government of West Bengal. Can we have three eminent panelists uh, unmuted and their videos on before we start this conversation? Now, you might, I'm, I'm, I'm telling this to the audience, you might think I'm the most incapable among these four people today evening because I'm a journalist. And as you know, as you're used to, journalists have half-baked information. They don't know much. I, I do not agree to that much, but I will start off with a very journalistic way, in a very journalistic way. And uh, I was going through some of the documents that are available, UN documents, World Economic Forum documents. And something very surprising was the fact that the World Economic Forum Report 2020 says that if we go by with the pace that we are going now, then probably by the next, in the next 108 years, this world will see some sort of gender equality. I lay the floor open for the panelists one by one uh, with this opening sentence, not mine, the World Economic Forum Report. I would invite Professor Dr. Bula Bhadru first to take the floor and share her thoughts with us. I would request the guests to stay, maintain the time limit, which is initially 10 minutes, and then we'll take questions later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jackson. And thank you, Shivarin, for uh, giving Sister uh, Nivedita the opportunity, and myself also, to share our experience. Uh, let me start with a note of caution, because uh, these days we don't talk about gender equality. We talk about equalities because um, they depend on class, sexuality, age, disability, uh, nation, country, region, etc., which are known as intersectional axis of disadvantage or advantage. But here, due to shortage of time, I'll just uh, you know share some common points uh, which gender equality uh, might cover each of the group. So to say, am I audible, Mr. Chatsky? Am I properly audible? Am I properly audible? Can you hear me? Ma'am, your, your voice is not uh, very clear and audible. Can you raise your voice or uh, say the microphone? The microphone is... in the highest. Can you now hear me? Yeah, better. 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 Okay, because uh, uh, I don't know, maybe could, there could be some server problem. Is it better now? Yeah, better. Okay. 
should I uh, then uh, repeat the remark? Because that will take another minute away. You don't mind, please. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I will. Okay, I start with a note of caution about this topic because these days we don't discuss gender equality. We discuss gender equalities in terms of plural because they vary. Uh, women are not homogeneous, so they vary on class, sexuality, age, disability, nation, country, region, which are known as intersectional excess of disadvantage or advantage. But here, due to shortage of time, I'll just uh, you know, touch on some common points of gender inequality. Um, in fact, in India, gender inequality starts with the notion of son preference because we kill our girl child in the fetus as much as we can so that our uh, girl ch children are only 940 uh, compared to the 1,000 boys. Uh, and we're expecting that it will go up a little bit like 958 in 2021 census. And discrimination actually in every sphere of life, education, health, uh, insistence on marriage for girls, etc. I'll begin, I will begin with a local incident during the COVID pandemic, which might actually highlight a kind of a mind state we are still in, in terms of women. There were four people in a district of Chuchura, uh, in the subdivision of Chuchura in the district of Hubli. There were four people tested COVID. So the municipal corporation people went to their house and wanted to see what is the situation. Now the woman of the house was so showing symptoms. The others were non-symptomatic, that is asymptomatic. So they said that we have to hospitalize the woman of the house. Now what happened is that uh, the husband of the house said, no, you cannot take her. You take any one of us from the three people. Then the municipal corporation employees were very surprised. They said, how is that a possibility? You are all non-symptomatic and she is showing symptoms. She needs to be hospitalized. Then the husband said, no, who is going to cook for us if you take her? So don't take her, take any one of us. Then the municipal corporation uh, <clears throat> employees actually fought and they were unable to uh, really uh, convince the husband. That time they said that, uh, you know, what you do actually, uh, we call the police if we don't actually allow your wife to go to the hospital. Then the matter came to an end. And this was reported by the nodal officer of the Municipal Corporation of Chuchura and then came out in a Bengali weekly on July 30th, 2020. So this is a classic case even when in COVID pandemic that the woman of the house has to cook for three other people and the husband is not allowing the woman to be hospitalized. This is a real incident. So I would say that COVID pandemic is a global crisis, but it's a double crisis for women. That's why United Nations Women in New York on 27th May 2020 has declared shadow pandemic. That is double pandemic for the women. Uh, the main slogan of the pandemic is stay home, stay safe. Now the contesting position is women are not safe all over the world. And it's a global phenomenon, not an Indian phenomenon. Women are not safe at home. Mr. Chatterjee, are you, am I clear now? Am I yes, audible properly? Yes. I, I okay. Think, I think okay. I will begin. Okay. So this is a global scenario where women are everywhere being tormented and the domestic violence has increased in every country. There is not a single country we can say the domestic violence hasn't increased. In fact, in India, it has increased so much that National Commission for Women has to declare that it has never happened. In 68 days, 1,500 cases have been reported, which have never happened in the last 10 years. So it's more than a decade. India this year has dropped, like Britain, I must say. Britain dropped six places from 15 to 21st in the World Economic Forum Global Gender Gap. 
and India dropped four places from 100 and it became 112 from 108. So both of the countries with different kind of economic situation have actually dropped in the gender gap scenario. So gender inequality seems to be a global calamity along with the even COVID pandemic. It has its own dimension, which apparently male doesn't have. Now, the Sustainable Development Goal Index ranks India at 95 out of 129 countries. One of the interesting yardstick or indicator is that Indian men spend 52 minutes of household work, which I think also greatly exaggerated, uh, compared to the women of 352 minutes, 577% more than men. And it is naturally assumed still that women can take care of three C's, cooking, cleaning, and caring. And as if the women are almost born with cooking recipes attached to their uteruses, and they can really do it, and as if it's a natural activity. And all over India, we have a rise of sexual harassment, 14%. Child sexual abuse, 109 per day. These are official reports by National Crime Record Bureau. And most women believe that 55% of women are sexually harassed in the workplace. And even in POXO cases, the law we believe is a very strong law for the protection of the children from crime. POXO cases, cases are pending, even 20% cases have not been investigated properly. So pendency is very high, so high in POXO cases that Koila Shatati, the Nobel laureate, had to go to the minister and appeal, but nothing happened yet. On the professional life, let me talk about one minute at this women in science. Women in science and technology profession makes about 14% only, whereas the global average is 28%. It was so appalling to see in 2018 Women's Science Congress that only two women are sitting there in the dais because there are no women scientists apparently could be found. So, or even if they are found, they are not focused by the mainstream media. When we had Chandrayaan mission, there were eight women scientists who were from ISRO, but we didn't come to know until and unless the alternative media focused on it. The mainstream media just skipped them. So naturally, 11 lakh students apply for JE. 72% are male still. Now, this is not only uh, inequality, it's just the icing. I mean, I'm, I'm able to just touch the icing on it because there are further deeper inequalities like glass ceiling and liquid pipeline, which are very heavy in India. In India, you will find a complete attrition after marriage. Because see, in India, we are told like death is inevitable and marriage is inevitable for women. So marriage has become a destiny for women in India. You have to marry by hook or by crook. If you are not married, you are considered something not normal, so to speak. So the attrition has come from after marriage Science, we have 37% PhDs and only 13% retain or remain in the career. In the premier institutes like IITs and IISCs, there are only 5 to 7% of women. So they don't even hire women. And we all know about the famous position of C.V. Ramon and Kamala Shalini case by now, that he yeah. did not admit her as because she was women and she was the first women scientist to get a PhD. And she did the PhD from Cambridge University. Now, we can ju cannot just, a sociologist cannot just talk about inequalities and problems. I'm, I'm, I'm to, sorry to, I'm I sorry will to give, I will take one more minute. Okay, I'll sure. Give, sure. I'll give one, two solutions for it. Can we consider at the time of birth that a child is being born? Can we consider at the time of rearing that we are rearing a child, irrespective of boy or girl? Can we tell all our children that we want to be good individuals, not good women or good men? Can we tell our men and women not to dress womanly or not to talk womanly, etc.? 
So we actually create women, not the children create themselves. Because children do not know up to a certain age that they are at all men or women. No, I finish with this position that gender equality is not a concept. It is like gravity. We have to have it because we want to stand up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bhadru. We'll come back to you once the floor opens up after the initial comments. We'll now move on to Professor Goswami and uh, ask her to share her thoughts with us. Another 10 minutes for you, Richard. Good evening, everybody. A heartfelt gratitude to Sister Nivedita University, uh, all the faculty members there, to the British Deputy High Commission, uh, the Chief Ning alumni and dear students. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts here. And it is an honor and a privilege to share uh, the panel with Professor Bula Bhadru, who's been my teacher and a lot of things uh, around gender is what I learned from her. So as I was hearing her, I figured out that she has already said a lot of things that I intended to speak on. So I'll just give a couple of pegging points um, because you can have a discussion around uh, gender inequalities for uh, for hours together. So we will just take a few minutes and have a few pegging points uh, today. So as, uh, as Professor Bhadra had already said that today when we discuss gender, we have to discuss it in conjunction with other inequalities, not only on the basis of gender, but how gender intersects with class, caste, race, sexuality, able-bodiedness, age, uh, location, region, religion, everything, right? Um, but what I want to focus on right in the beginning is that perhaps today when we discuss gender inequalities, we also need to move beyond the binary of talking about the power equations between men and women in any existing society. Because today the discourse around gender has expanded to include uh, discussing gender as a spectrum, as a rainbow not only composed of quote unquote biological cisgender men and women who are heterosexual, but people uh, with non-normative sexualities, which is uh, people who have same sex partners, and very importantly, to talk about transgender people across the globe and in India today. To draw your attention that India's uh, we do have a law which makes transgender people as legal citizens of India since a judgment that came out in 2014, known as the Nalsa judgment popularly. But policy is a far cry around transgender people in India in terms of their access to education, their access to employment and all other rights that flow from the constitution. And also we need to talk about uh, other people who are born or they grow up as men and women, but they have a non-normative sexual orientation, which uh, put simply is uh, gay and lesbian people or uh, could be bisexual as well. So we need to talk about all of these groups and the way gender inequality operates is that all of these people are marginalized along with women in a patriarchal context because that is what patriarchy does to us. Um, that women of different hues and colors and other men and women of non-normative sexualities and transgender people uh, who do not fit into this binary of man or woman, they are completely left to lurch in a patriarchy. While there are certain laws that, are, that have come in India, uh, we, really, we, we nearly have all uh, laws which talk about gender equality in India, but the implementation of those laws, and also if we read those laws a little closely, we will find that there are many gaps from where, you know, uh, it, it's so formally you have gender equality, but in practicality, in the implementation of the law, in the reading and the applicability of the law, 
women and other groups are completely left to lurch. Uh, also, um, drawing on uh, from Dr. Baldro, he, she's already referred to this earlier, is that that we live in a gender unequal world has been brought into sharp focus with the pandemic. Uh, you know, we were, a lot of us uh, were believing in the beginning that this, and uh, you know, it was also being discussed, you know, this pandemic is a great equalizer, you know, it, it attacks everybody and anybody irrespective of where you come from. Um, no, the pandemic is not a great equalizer because the impact that it has on different kinds of people, depending on whether they are migrant workers or they are upper middle class people, whether they are rural or urban, or whether they are men and women is very, very different. So if you're looking at the pe uh, COVID pandemic, we see that uh, domestic violence against women have risen sharply globally and in India. We have also seen that not only against women, but also we recognize and feminist literature to which I'll come just in a bit, has shown that family, as much as we uh, are made to believe that it is where we should stay because it is a safe place, it is within the family, which is, which is also a site of violence. And there are not only women, but all on transgender people, people of non-normative, sexualities have a very, very hard time. People who wanted to hide their sexuality within the family are now forced to stay within a familial context because you are not allowed to go out. So a space, the outer world was a space of freedom for women and other groups. And that space is closed down in the pandemic. And there's a sharp rise in domestic violence. Second, uh, we have seen jokes and memes and also serious discussion on the tremendous burden of caregiving and housework that has come to women uh, during the pandemic, because we are deprived uh, for, for middle class families, we have been deprived, you know, domestic help wasn't coming in. And so women had to really do all this burden of caregiving and household work. We have also seen that women constitute the bulk of the unorganized workforce in India. And the, with, with job cuts during the pandemic, the first people to lose jobs, especially in the unorganized sector, were women. For transgender people, jobs have not even come. So the point about them losing jobs is, again, a far cry. So, so the pandemic has actually shown us that we do not live in a gender equal world at all. And there is a lot to be achieved. Now, if we look at um, the, if we just go back to the pre-pandemic world and, and see that, uh, especially in the job market, uh, and if you look at India, then even in the corporate sector, um, there are very few women. You know, of course, in politics and of course in science, but in the corporate houses, uh, women constitute around roughly around 13 percent of uh, board members, um, or in spite of specific laws uh, in, in, in corporate law, which says that you need to have one member, one woman member in the board. And even, and there's a lot of talk around that being tokenistic. So there have been various studies conducted by McKenzie, Deloitte, World Economic Forum, etc., which has shown that women's space in the business market is, is really, really low. And women, when they occupy spaces in, in employment sector, they really constitute the bottom end. Coupled with that, if we look at biases and prejudices, and sometimes these biases and prejudices are not recognized, then we see that in spite of this new law on uh, transgender people coming into the education and the workplace, there are very few workspaces that have opened up. It's just begun and we need to recognize, we need to first start with education, right? Uh, we are first only acknowledging that transgender people are citizens of this country. Right. So to, to actually give space to transgender children in education, which school do they go to? Our schools are either boys schools or girls schools or queer schools, right? And so much so for the employment sector as well. And that is a space that we need to talk about. Finally, to, uh, to, to sort of wrap it up, um, 
you know, all this discussion around gender um, comes from feminism. Uh, and it is feminism that has taught us patriarchy, uh, the public-private divide, where women's work is unrecognized and unremunerated. Women's work is no work. We listen to our moms and several other homemakers who have said, I don't do any work. I, I you know, I'm a housewife. So, you know, there is a self um, devaluation, right, of women. And, and patriarchy survives on this, where men's work and men's values are, are, are valued and, and recognized, and women do all the monotonous drudgery, backbreaking work, which is necessary for for capitalism to survive, for patriarchy mm -hmm. to survive. And yet, um, you know, there is very little recognition. Who taught us gender, the question of equality and inequality on the basis of gender? It has been the feminist movement. And I know that for several of even young people today, you know, we cringe at this word. And that is a problem because, uh, you know, a lot of young men and women I meet uh, also say, you know, I am a great believer in equality, but I'm not a feminist, you know, I'm a humanist. What do we really mean by that? Uh, I'm not really saying that everybody should subscribe to that label. We can live in a world without labels, that's fine. But it is feminism which has taught us equality or on the basis of genders. It has taught us about equal opportunities in education, workplace, to fight against gender-based violence. Uh, uh, and also today, it is, you know, if we, if we start looking at also at the virtual space, the virtual space the online space is as much gendered as the non-online space, right? As the corporeal material space. Because the virtual space is also an extension of the material corporeal space in which there's a lot of online trolling, hate speech, and that is targeted mainly towards women. Also, media's portrayal, which is a different um, subject matter altogether. So, you know, the online space is not, there is no gender neutral space. Right from the moment we are born and children are assigned mm -hmm. a gender as a boy or a girl, wrapped up in pink and wrapped up in blue and do right. color coded. To, to this virtual space in which we are sitting and imagining nobody can really see me, gender plays out. We just need to look around us and see every decision that we make, there is a gender. We can talk about statistics, but all global statistics from the UN show that India's position, unfortunately, is still pretty much below, uh, Dr. Bhadra also talked about the World Economic Forum of the Global Gender Gap, where India is 112 out of 153. The Human Development Index, which is not gender corrected, shows India's position as 130 out of 189. And if we do the Gender Inequality Index, which is corrected with gender, then we see India's position is 95 out of 129. Not a very, very great scenario, right? Of course, a lot of things have happened. We have gone a long way, but we need to engage more and more and discuss gender. Mm -hmm. Finally, last but not the least, we need to actually talk about gender violence, gender inequality, um, you know, homophobia and all of that, not only with uh, women and girls and not only with queer groups, but also to men. I think we really need to catch those boys really young and engage with boys because feminism is not about biology. It's not that men can't be supporters of the equality cause. And we need to work on that. And because we, we you know, feminism is not anti-men at all. That's a wrong portrayal. We need men and women, girls and boys to join the struggle together. On that note, I'm going to call it a day mm -hmm. and over to Arjun. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this time. Thank you, Professor Goswami. I'm not letting you, to, letting you call it a day yet. <laughs> the completion of the first round. I was so intrigued in asking you, you know, your, uh, your bit on feminism reminded me of the 1915 uh, New York writer Floyd Dell, who said uh, feminism, I think, will make it for the first time for men to be free. I mean, we can have... But uh, I started this panel discussion stating a World Economic Forum report. And since you're talking about a lot about public policy, I would quote a couple of more data. The biggest gaps to close in the economic 
and political empowerment dimensions, according to again, World Economic Forum report, will take 202 years and 107 years respectively. I mean, are we just, I, I'm sure I can, I will quote some Oxfam report since this is a UK, India uh, convention sort of thing happening, a discourse, a dialogue. But you know, it's as Dr. Bhadra pointed out, it's global. Yes, it's global. I also want to understand whether it's just aspirational. Mm -hmm. or is there anything happening in terms of public policy? I don't think there's anyone better than uh, Bala, our dear friend K. Bala Murugan, who's also a, a bureaucrat and presently the chief conservator uh, with the government of West Bengal Forest Department. Uh, if I can invite Mr. Bala Murugan and give him his 10 minutes, because we um, before which uh, you have spoken and after which we, I will open the floor and take questions. Hi, all. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. I feel like a batsman coming after uh, Sachin is out. You know, like <laughs> like how the professor and uh, Ruchira spoke. Like I'm not an expert in this field. Whatever little knowledge, I'm happy to share. Before that, I want to thank uh, Ajita uh, Supriya for this opportunity. A nice initiative. Thanks to Arjun for nice, you know, compare, comparing here. Uh, when Supriya told about like uh, what students may get uh, living in UK, I remember like I actually was honestly sensitized on gender. Even whatever the amount of book or library you read here, when you go and see it when in, in a developed country, we, we it's like hammering on our head, like how stereotypic you, you are. And it starts from, you know, from the airport. Like uh, now, actually being an Indian, we don't require, you know, statistics to say about gender inequality, the social issue is everywhere there. We all know it, we, we live through it. Uh, I would say the social issue of gender inequality even worse than untouchability or casteism for the reason, if you think about community, uh, community aspect or casteism, they all live in a particular, suppose live in a particular uh, group in a particular location, whereas the gender inequality is in our homes. Uh, it, it, is, it is everywhere, it is, it, it, it is in our mind. So I would touch uh, the economic aspect of the gender inequality. I would call this as an economic sin. Uh, uh, I, I want to speak about two points. One is the economic sin, and another one is truth. Now, what is an economic sin? India is a developing country where 300 million people are below the poverty line, acute, acutely poor, and if you don't help them, they are going to die, that kind of poverty. And we are a $3.2 trillion economy, but can you imagine we are losing $1.2 trillion to $2 trillion every year because we are very poor in involving our women in the workforce. In India, only less than 25% of women are in the workforce, in the formal workforce, though they are educated. And you can see like when you open the newspaper during this, uh, you know, result time, 10th, 12th, you can always see girls are topping. They are good at studies. They are probably better than uh, men, but our workforce involvement is only less than 25%. Whereas in, uh, in European countries, it is more than 60%. It is costing a loss of $1.22 trillion. It, it, it is what do you call, is it not an economic sin for a country like India? Why should we lose? So who is stopping women to go out and work? Nobody, we, we can't, we can't, you know, it is a very intricate issue. We can't say within somebody's in the family, it is only men. It is everywhere. There is a safety issue. There is social stereotyping. There are so many issues, very, very co complexly integrated in this. So that's why I'm going to now talk about what is truth. To the student, I would just ask you like, if I say that truth has versions, I don't know if you are going to believe it or not, but truth is as versions. There are truth with, which is universally true. For example, if I say that this is a pen, even if I go and show this in Germany, they are going to say it is a pen, right? These are all called universal truth, but there are certain truth which is put in our mind and made to believe as truth. One thing is like gender. For example, this is the way women have to dress. This is the way they have to speak. They should not laugh more. If, if this kind of truth, or this is the way, for example, just I, I have some pictures. Uh, uh, Arjun, is it possible to, you know, I can I share my screen? 
I, I think you can, but beyond the domain of my accountability, I guess, today evening, I'm sure somebody is there to help you out. Uh, but you can try. I mean, okay, like one second. I just want to my uh, sh share my screen. Okay, that's fine. I don't want to because you've given me only ten minutes. Imagine, uh, imagine a, a tribal woman living in Andaman Nicobar Island. I'm I'm telling you to all the students. She may have probably a kind of ornament around her head, and neck, or the way she dresses. She would have been made to believe if she is not wearing that kind of ornament or dress, she is not a a normal woman living in that group. If if she goes to Germany, how she will look at the women there? Or if the German people are asked to, or the UK people, UK uh, ladies are asked to like dress like this, how are they going to uh, think about it? So the point I want to raise this gender, like how female should be, how they are treat their treatment is mental. It is a mental construction. It is not a universal truth. It is socially constructed and made to believe, like how casteism is being done. It is the same. If two caste people go to, uh, if a foreigner see two caste people, if they won't be identified which which person is from which caste because it is a con, con socially constructed. Same is the gender. So this is the point I want to say that so there is there are two type of truth. One is universally accepted truth, like this is a pen, and there are truth which is made us to be believed like that is what gender, like stereotyping. This is how you have to dress. You should not go out by evening. Only women have to cook, and uh, uh, only women can sweep the floor. Uh, these are all socially constructed, and this is called cage of norms. Asimogla has written a wonderful book. I want to show them to students. The narrow corridor. Yeah. I don't know uh, if you are able to see. It is called cage of norms. We should come out of this shackle, and the benefit we are getting is 1.2 trillion dollar to 2 trillion dollar. Why is it very important? In India, we are speaking about 1.3 billion. About 40 crore women. They have a capability to work. They they can contribute to the economy. They are not allowed due due to this studio, uh, stereotypes. This is the point I want to drive. So. For, at the cost of reputation, I want to summarize. One is economic sin, sin which is happening in India due to gender inequality. And another is the kind of truth which you are made to believe that is socially constructed truth that we have to remove the shackles out of it and come out. So now, understanding this, UNDP had made a new strategy. UNDP wanted to properly implement the Sustainable Development Goal. This is the last point, Arjun. Absolutely. There are 17, 17 uh, Sustainable Absolutely. Development Goal, including you know, poverty, health, the climate, uh, hunger, so many things. They have found by research, if you concentrate on one aspect, only one Sustainable Development, one goal, it has a multiplayer effect on all the goal. You know what is that? That goal is gender inequality. Because if a woman is empowered, if she has the space, if she has the, she has the freedom, and she can nicely, naturally the family's you know, income will go high, health will go high, she can better take care of others. It has a multiplier cascading effects. So such important thing we are speaking about here. Thanks for the wonderful opportunity to all the initiators. Fine, thank you. I will now lay the floor open, but before that, because you know, modern day journalism has pushed us to a point where we should now start focusing on survey reports and data journalism. I will put a few data on the uh, in front of everyone, as Bala had rightly pointed out. It's 1.2 trillion in India. It's about 10.8 trillion dollars, according to Oxfam report, that women's unpaid care costs. Do we need to incentivize that? I mean, $10.8 trillion is equivalent to economies of quite a few countries clubbed together. Point number two, according to ILO, International Labour Organization, 12.5 billion hours of free work are done by women. And this includes fetching firewood, uh, watering plants, uh, feeding the child, cleaning, cooking, all of that. It's 12.5 billion hours of free work. And then, uh, as we know, in, even in journalism practices, we, the sociologists here would agree, we know the GM, GDI, GII, and the GGI, the different indexes, indices to measure a country's uh, gender equality gap. Now, I was reading a very fascinating article which says 
that gender equality also keeps the household happy. And household happy, I'm sure Ruchiradi is smiling. I mean, my wife would also smile. It keeps the household happy, which means it effectively, in a cascading effect, increases the potential of work for both the male and the female. And also the third gender or the transgender, whoever is in the house. Now, Ruchiradi had pointed out something very interesting, which was the domestic violence and the feminist literature, which says the house is a very safe place. And house is also the place where you see domestic violence. Now, in such, so much of chaos, where do we see things materializing? Are you senior academicians, bureaucrats here, the panelists? I'm asking this question to all of you. Is this the way forward to incentivize this gap, make governments understand, because everyone understands money and governments understand it better than most citizens in the world. So if they can be made to understand that if you don't follow this, then you are losing out a lot of money, which can later be translated into developmental work. If I may ask Dr. Bhadra to start. Uh, well, um, I would say uh, your journalistic gut or your journalistic knowledge, whatever that is, no, all governments do not understand how to look at money, quote unquote. Because uh, the last six years, the government of India did not understand how to handle money or the finance. So in last 40 years, which we did not see in India, we are now there. We are now in the bottom of our economic, all economic index and criteria. And Reserve Bank published that we have zero growth in the last two quarters. So no, all governments didn't understand money for people. They might understand the, uh, money for a group of people, which the, our government has understand, central government. So they did not. So that's one point. Second point is that it's not just money uh, that will come. It will make women's health, education, respect, and their existence altogether much better if we knew that women are not women. They are individuals and partners, and they can do what everybody can do, what men can do, what women can do. All these are same, except, except having to give birth in the womb, which some women also can't do, so they have to hire another women, surrogacy. So other than that, there is no other difference. So everybody can do everything. That has not been understood in India so far. That hasn't been understood in many countries so far. So even Britain at the moment is quite a sexist country in terms of Britain's position. So naturally, I wouldn't say that this is, again, this is India has lots of difficulties. But again, this is a global phenomenon. Because if domestic violence could rise, from United States to Sweden. Sweden had seen a domestic rise in Scandinavian country where we held them very high. And they are very high in the gender gap uh, uh, <coughs> table. They are in the first four or five. So if that could happen this way, so it is not that the government understand. The government would do effectively in the last five months to stop the domestic violence. I don't think government did much. All was done by United Nations and women's activists that domestic violence is steadily on the rise and women have no resort to report. To go to call a police is a problematic matter because everybody is at home. That hasn't been held by government at all. So I'm not going to be very positive about that governments understand money for the people. They understand money for their own group of people. That's the quotient. That's the cliche. No, I was just being aspirational in case governments do start understanding how it may... Well, if governments start understanding, then this would not happen. See, if government understood, then this would not have happened. Governments mm -hmm. did not understand, and that has happened. And then we had the colonial history. The yeah. huge... Actually, we run the, uh, you know, rip-off scenario for the last 174 years or 190 years. So it is now actually skyrocketed in terms of the gender inequality part. And gender inequality does not mean that we are leaving women. I mean, patriarchy doesn't mean men. That is to be a very literal understanding. 
patriarchy means a structure, a process, and actions by even women. By even women. Those who believe in those kind of hierarchical ideology, ideals between men and women. Right. So it, it's the mother who gives less to the daughter. So it's patriarchy again. So we are not actually equating men with patriarchy. I will take a quick question from the chat box. Very interesting questions coming here. Uh, Shreya Mitra has asked, and I'll direct this question to Professor Goswami. A mother has always been defined as a caregiver and a bearer of the family tree. Do you think this very idea has kept the ferocious side of patriarchy alive? And then we have a very senior, our dear Mr. Ujjal Choudhury, a senior achieving scholar. Uh, he has asked if we, I'll take this question. From my experience, it's a deep rooted cultural issue spent some time in the Pacific Island nation. Ladies go to work in highly paid and respectable positions, example, bank managers. Enforcement mechanism is not there. Professor Goswami, if you can address those two questions. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. It is uh, when women, this uh, unequal burden on women to do uh, housework and to do caregiving work is what patriarchy does and sort of naturalizes this as if, uh, you know, and, and, and we've done it for generations, you know, women have borne the brunt of housework and caregiving work. And to, to the extent that we sort of, we have naturalized as if it is something genetically engineered for women to do, which is not, this, which is not the case at all. So as, as just was spoken uh, earlier, that apart from, uh, the biological fact of giving birth, which some women want to do, some women choose to do, and many other women might not do or might not even choose to do, right? There is nothing. And maybe breastfeeding for the first six months, again, something that you can choose to do or want to do whatever. Um, nothing else is gender coded. I mean, it's, it's nothing else is naturally there. So, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the greatest problem of this is all we... We just put it to love and see the mother's love, etc. So if it was so much for love, then we need to recognize love a little more, right? In material terms, which we don't. We, we in most societies, move on a patrilineal line um, where the fathers are assumed to be natural guardians, quote unquote. Uh, we inherit patrilineal lines. We move into patrilocal families, which is women shift into husband's family, except, of course, certain areas uh, all over India. So, you know, that, that, that's the problem. So all of this needs to be undone. And that is how what I said earlier, because it, it bases itself on unrecognized and unremunerative labor on, uh, of women. And, and to go back to the question that... Um, that uh, uh, you know was raised earlier is that only if uh, feminist uh, economists have been doing this for some time it has not come into mainstream uh, academia uh, feminist economists have been talking about national system of accounting which takes into consideration uh, women's unpaid labor and there and thereafter the ILO has many studies on this and mm -hmm. only if you were to attach that to the GDP, you will see the GDP soaring, right? But we don't, we simply don't. And that is one of the major reasons. Uh, the second question, yes, women can, can be in highly paid jobs, but I think globally this 50-50% is not, is, is very, very far. So even if women are in highly paid jobs, it's or say upper middle class women in good jobs, um, they would still, uh, what we call double day burden. They will still have to be responsible for household work in most cases. And if they aren't doing it themselves, like, you know, she goes to the office, she comes back and cooks, then she would have to employ somebody. And most of her domestic workers are women again. So then we employ some other woman to take care of the household, right? I can go out and work because there is somebody else at home who and, and mostly a woman who is doing that work, right? And that is how gender sort of propagates itself. It bases itself on this uh, gender division of labor between men and women, and that is what we need to change. And India, as I said, is one of the worst, unfortunately, when it comes to men in household work. Women have gone out to the public sphere, but have, have increased their burden, but men have not come to 
the domestic sphere as much as we want. That needs to change. Right. Mr. Chapsi, can uh, I just one yeah, yeah. sentence add to this? Uh, yeah. I think uh, women are very responsible mothers who believe that the, their sons cannot do household chores. There are lots of mothers in India. They believe their uh, sons cannot even, you know, toast, make a toast or cup of tea. So that's one of the root cause that we need to re-socialize the mothers specifically that, you know, what a man can do, a woman can do. I would blame mothers also. I would not spare them at all. Dr. Bhattu, if I can humbly, I would, I would agree to disagree a bit also as a journalist. I've traveled to the Northeast, Arunachal, where you very well know that there are villages which are, which have more men and less women. Uh, and there I had seen very opposite women. stories. Yeah, uh, Northeast is a different story. Exactly. But Northeast is not considered mainland India anymore. I North think the this story part. goes to the eastern part, the valley and the estuary. Northern part, the eastern part. And the Bengali mothers and the central yeah. India mothers. And, and, and UP mothers, Bihar mothers and even Tamil Nadu. I, I would leave it on Bala to answer that on a personal note later on. But <laughs> looking, at, uh, looking at a possible solution, completely aspirational in terms of, you know, it's mentioned in the UN uh, SDGs, 17 SDGs. Now, we look at solutions which are tangible. So it's C4D. Now, if it's communication for development, and we take communication for development as a gender strategy in terms of public policy, and I'm throwing this question to Mr. Balamurugan, do you think there can be effective change? Because then, if it's communication for development, work for development, which leads to possible positive outcomes, then somewhere down the line, we don't consider subjects as male, female, or transgender. We consider them as productive entity, entities who can then deliver more productivity. Can we move towards that approach? And that has to be very, very policy oriented. You work in the government framework. You know how, uh, allow me to say that, dull and boring it is. I'm not offending your workspace at all, but <laughs> I have worked with them, but tell me in terms of public policy making, how proactive do you see government officials are? Uh, first of all, I, I slightly differ with the thinking that government should do this. Government uh, is supposed to, you know, voluntarily take care of this issue is a very ideal thinking. I'll quote an example. Uh, you take even US, UK. In UK, during 1903, they have started, all women united and started a movement called suffragettes. The leader of the movement asked for only one thing, Emily Davison, you can, you can Google, students can Google. She only asked, yeah, voting right. That was not given. And uh, at one occasion, she has to leave her life. There was a, uh, there was a horse race uh, and she wants to popularize the, this issue that women should get voting right. And she went before the hearts of the king and she lost her life after four years, they got equal women right, women political, women voting right. The point I want to say is it's possible only by social mobilization. Why will the government have to do all these things? Nowhere it has happened, no, no history in the whole world, which is the government has done automatically good things for uh, people. They do things only which has a severe demand. Uh, Ajita would agree with me, she's a political economist. Unless there is a political exigency, Government is not going to have because you're losing this much economy. No, that may be, it may be, they may assure in the constitution, that may be a fundamental right, that may be article 39 or whatever. But to get this, that should be unity among, there should be so many association among women, and there should be a movement, like this Me Too movement, as, uh, in, a, in a small way, it has, it has created uh, vibration. This is what my, I have not answered you a question, Arjun, I know. But what is the point I want to raise? It's possible only by social mobilization. May I just say just one thing to Bala Murugan? I am itching to say this. All the things women got because women made movement. None of the legislation has been passed in favor of women when otherwise women's bitter struggle, arduous struggle. Look at the rep law, arduous struggle in India. So government hasn't done anything for women so far. 
whatever we have done for us has been translated because they need our votes. Don't forget, we are 48.9%. Still. Oh, now. <laughs> so it, it, it now comes down to parliamentary democracy. Voting. Fantastic. Uh, but Professor Goswami raises raise her hand. No, no, I was just seconding. I was oh, saying, don't no, forget the agreed. Ruchira was supporting me. I know that. <laughs> that has to be uh, uh, Arjun, has... Arjun, I want to add yeah. only one point here. You know, the big hope is you, yeah. media. <laughs> oh, we, we have the democracy space in our country. We have a very good media. Not the mainstream uh, media, but the alternative yes. media. My private it's physician possible. will ask it's... me not to become take satires in the evening. <laughs> Please avoid that. Uh, but I will take the questions instead. Yeah, there are a lot. There are a lot of questions, and I'm, I think they're cursing me for not taking them. But I'll take one by one. So I'll ask the panelists to, I'll read out the questions and direct each question to each one of you. Uh, Anushwa Mohitra, how does intersecting parameters of disability and gender impact everyday life experience of women with disabilities? Uh, Ishani Dev asks, health sector globally are stereotyped as a feminine job, okay, care, caregiving. In the electronic and print media recently, ABP, okay. No special comments. The segments are presented on female health professionals. Suparna Ghosh asks, the COVID-19 pandemic has proven to be a disaster for feminism. I think this question should go to Professor Goswami. Women and girls are one of the worst affected social group across the world. And the pandemic is already reversing most of the gains that women have made in the last century. Based on this, do you think there is a need for gender sensitive response a pandemic to a pandemic that doesn't discriminate? Navnita Nandan, could you put forward your ideas on common saying women pull other women down? Uh, that can be an interesting reply. I want to hear that from Dr. Bhadru, if that's okay. Uh, then we have good women versus bad women. Uh, can we have Shonchita Gangopadha is asking a question to Dr. Bhadru. Why marriage is so emphasized for women in India? Okay. And Totally right. Navajit uh, Day is asking, hated cooking, but cooked for the entire year during the evening years. I think so. He got ungendered during his evening scholarship. Uh, did you, Navajit? Okay. okay. We'll halt for the timing and take the replies one by one. Uh, yes, Professor Goswami. First question for Ruchira. Yeah. So what was, can you come back on the question? Uh, I forgot the question. Uh, okay. So we will... The take this one. One was the affecting parameters of disability and gender impact. Right. One on that, and then the COVID nineteen pandemic has proven to be disaster for feminism. So do we uh, need to have a gender sensitive approach or not? Right. Um, the first question warrants a whole huge discussion in itself. I don't think it, it, we can answer this in a minute, but there is a lot of um, studies and a lot of activism uh, going on in India on the intersection between um, gender and disability. Uh, and again, disability is not a homogeneous whole. There are, there are different kinds of disabilities and how uh, women with disabilities suffer, it, it depends on the kind of disability. Absolutely point very well taken that, and the disability sector has had to fight for a long time for actually speaking separately about women there. All mainstream movements also don't then talk about women. So point very well taken that the moment you intersect as I said, gender with any other axis of um, oppression, it just worsens, right? And it takes completely new form. Um, there is a, you know, there are certain laws on disability. There are certain movements uh, that are going on. And I think, you know, I can, I, we really cannot really do justice to this question here. Um, the next question from Ishani Dev. Right. No, just, just add that. one thing to do yeah. justice to the question. Uh, Anushma Moitra, I think, you know, uh, this will require a separate discussion, but there's one point that uh, this pandemic has shown two things. One, the upper class disabled person were better off than the lower income to disabled person. Yes. That has shown very nakedly that how the lower income to disabled person were actually starved. Yes. So that you can see that a catastrophe like pandemic and class and disability intersect 
and then gender takes a back seat. That, that sort of an indication has come out in the pandemic. I'm sure the research is that will come out. Right. And before I much proceed, more food for thought. Yeah. Before I proceed, uh, since we have crossed 7.30, I right. would like to ask the organizers if we are allowed to continue the seminal conversation on gender equality. Yes, uh, definitely. You're free to continue. Please do okay. so. I will take another 15, 20 minutes. I hope uh, we will be able to answer the questions in that case. So back to Professor Goswami. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Bose, for allowing us. Back to Professor Goswami. There's an interesting question. How do you account for the unpaid hours of work the women, heterogeneous category, health professionals are devoting in this COVID-19 situation as compared to males? What kind of difference, difficulty exists? Oh, um, each one of them now warrants a discussion. So I, 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 I'm yeah. sure I can't be doing justice to this at all. Um, the, the question about COVID pandemic, which I said right when I was speaking, was has thrown up uh, the gender disparity like ever before. So women are the, are the receiving end of... Um, of, of this pandemic, uh, putting in more labor and getting less. And the similar thing goes for health workers. I was checking out the media and an overarching number of health workers, uh, not only doctors, but doctors, nurses, IRs, everybody are women, of course. And then again, if you look at the media and a lot of women uh, in the health sector have also lost their lives. But if you look at the media, um, uh, I, I mean, I'm not again trying to homogenize the media, but it seems that people who are speaking mm -hmm. on the pandemic, the experts are men, like any other sector. You know, all I don't know, I may be wrong, uh, that all the doctors who come on TV to tell us during the pandemic, they are all men. And I'm, I'm really surprised uh, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of women doctors and the whole other health se sector people are women who haven't really sort of uh, been reflected uh, adequately by the media, except for saying they are, you know, Corona warriors, which anyway is a different thing. I um, feel like butting in them. Sorry. I, you know, uh, my wife is a doctor and she was treating COVID patients. And I asked yes. her, I asked her, and this struck me also when I looked at these vernacular news channels, all the experts were male. And I said, Absolutely. why don't you go on also? Uh, let me see you on TV. She said the chairs are not empty. So uh, probably the chairs are not empty. I don't know. But yes, it struck a chord. Please carry yeah. on. Yes, yes, absolutely. So that's for the health worker. I also said the other question that was, has the COVID pandemic uh, put a death knell on feminism and we have all lost all the gains? Um, no, I am an optimist, unfortunately, even in these horrible times that we live in. I don't think we have lost the gains. You know, we have lost a lot of things. It's, it's, it's one of the most difficult times. But, we, you know, all these years of struggle, Professor Bodra was talking about, you know, Bala talked about suffrage, but uh, closer home, you know, the rape law, all of these, this is not lost. It's a very difficult time. Uh, yes, women cannot report to domestic violence because the police is busy, you know, asking people to wear masks and go home. Um, so, you know, we haven't have specialized agencies which can listen to women's problems mm -hmm. or problems of any other group, transgender group included. But, you know, to say that we have gone back to square one, no, you cannot lose everything. And the death knell of feminism, feminism is more um, sturdy than we imagine. You know, we, many of us think it's going to die one day, you know, but it's no, we, I, I, I definitely don't believe, and it's completely my point of view, we haven't entered a post-feminist era at all. And, um, the gains of feminism are being are being questioned, but the fact that today we are sitting here with about 150 people talking about gender in itself is is the win of feminism, right? So why why are we even saying that we have lost? Yes, there are challenges. Nobody is questioning that, but that's the fight we have been fighting all the time, you know. So no, I don't think we have gone back in history. It's, it's, um, no, I, I think actually, I don't know why you were saying that uh, because COVID has said. I think we've gone stronger in the COVID. Look at yes. the uh, mobilization of women, hmm. for women, for uh, helping women. And that is a stronger point, which is get, not gaining, again, media coverage by mainstream media, yeah. not focusing by mainstream media, that women's groups are helping women 
tremendously yeah. to come yeah. out of it. Helping migrant labor, mm -hmm. that has not been actually publicized by media because that puts to shame to our governments and states that they haven't done that. So I would say we are getting strengthened, but we are not understanding that getting stronger. It takes sometimes time, but I would I would completely disagree that feminism feminisms have gone weakened at all. Because see, as Ruchira said, we keep some of us keep dreaming, not us but others keep dreaming that it will one day go down. <laughs> but no, it is not going to go down until we achieve that. You know what we call equality is not a concept. It's a necessity. The gravity we are looking for, we will do. Then it can be born. And if we do not talk about gender anymore, it will be then gender neutral. Dr. Bhadra, pardon me for saying this, but I'm intrigued in saying that soon the dictionary will have a synonym for moderator, which will be punching bag. <laughs> I am the no, one here. You, you said you are from media. Yes, so exactly. that is why I said that. And for a handful not of them. A, a moderator is not the punching bag, Mr. Chatterjee. I'm punching the, the mainstream media. I correct I'm myself. I'm punching the mainstream media. Fine. I, 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 I accept. I, I'm guilty as charged for no, punching I, I the mainstream media. I will do it with full might. But I was <laughs> also intrigued to ask this question since there is a lot of legality involved in this. And there are anticipatory bills, different laws that are implemented. Can we also look at the other side of it, where certain laws are implemented, which are pro-women, particularly in cases of domestic violence? I know of people who have gone through hell, and their gender was, they were males. But yes, the percentage of that is a lot less, is minuscule to the compa uh, compared to what kind of violence women face in our country. But in terms of law, there has to be some equity. Do we need to address that? that I was expecting a question coming from somebody. Positively. Of their I, I'll, I'll agree with you on that, that we need to take that men can cry, men need support, men have actual emotions, and we have deprived men from that and trying to make them unnecessarily macho. Because men do need people like women. Like. So obviously there must be a clause in saying that we're dealing with the individual. See, that is why we have to go to this binary men, women, transgender. All are individuals having the emotions, needing people. See, our laws are very gender bounded, no doubt about it. Even when we speak in favor of women. I'm sorry to interrupt. Two quest quick questions for Dr. Bhadro. And oh. then one last question to Bala and then we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, we'll take the questions from here, uh, Dr. Bhadra. Why marriage is so emphasized for women in India? And uh, the other thing is somebody asked, women have to, what was that? Uh, women pull other women down. Your idea, your analysis, your... Okay, okay let me take the women pulling down first, then I'll come to marriage. Uh, women, men, those who are influenced by the patriarchal ideology, uh, structures, etc., wants to keep the status quo, they pull everybody down. And women are mostly down because we are in a disadvantaged position. See, in every class, let's say two groups, men and women, in every class, women are in a dissatisfying condition compared to men. But that doesn't mean that the upper class women is not better off compared to working class men. They are better off. Upper class women are better off compared to working class men. But in a class, if we see as counterpart, then women of that class are in a particularly problematic position compared to the men of that class. So that's when class and gender intersect. And why marriage? Well, uh, death is often saying that it is inevitable for women. And we give death to a lot of women. Marriage has come as partner to death. That marriage will actually kill the woman while she is still alive. Remember Tagore, Rabindranath? We are actually alive, but we are dead. That is why marriage is so emphasized, because it's a torturous society. We are still in a mode of torture. We like this. So we give our daughter, instead of giving her education, health, <clears throat> equal status, we give her to matrimony. We save for matrimony. LIC has, Life Insurance India has, lot of uh, you know, policies for matrimony for women and then education for men. Save, save money for education of son, for save money child. for marriage of men. So <laughs> this is actually structured.
we we are not good for anything except marriage that was used to be the ideology now that is broken down some women have said that we don't need marriage why do we need marriage because we can be happy by ourselves there were some uh, happy home was talked about some homes are happy without being married I will now put the question to Mr. Bala Murugan. Uh, we have our own conversations with you, Bala, as well. I know Bala deals a lot with forests. Thankfully, forests are not gendered, so he has a good time talking to them, nurturing them, building them, helping the planet much more livable. Uh, Bala, in terms of public policy making, and I come back to that uh, because that's one way of believing it. Because I think it is a tall task, a colossal task in the subcontinent, in the region, in fact, in the whole world, to get some, somewhere closer. I will not live for 108 years. None of us will, I'm sure. Uh, God bless you if you do. You have a fantastic hygiene and fitness. But I'm sure none of us will. So I will not probably live to see that day when World Economic Forum says we will have gender equality, equal society. But in terms of public policy, what should be the priorities for any government? Uh, Arjun, I missed the last part. What should be the priority for priorities for any government? Make it participatory. You can say, yeah. With respect to uh, with respect India. to yeah. gender, with respect gender. to gender, gender equality. Yeah. With respect uh, to equality, sir. With yeah. respect to equality, not gender, equality. The main botheration, according to me, is the not gender inequality in workplace, such things. The root of the issue is gender inequality in the childhood. So we can make laws to uh, uh, for equal pay for against sexual harassment. There are committees, but the main issue, according to me, is how uh, boys and girls are treated differently in the Indian homes. So I don't think any law uh, can, you know, be a solution for this. It needs uh, more sensitization of this issue, like this initiative that you all have taken. That's a wonderful thing. So every school, every college, uh, there should be a kind of gender sensitizer. Absolutely. Every office should have a gender sensitizer. They should, because many even superior officers, even much educated people, they don't know this uh, uh, concept. What I've told is uh, like how we are made to believe this. Absolutely. This cultural beliefs has to be, you know, uh, we have to come out of this cage of cultural beliefs and the, uh, how how we are the prisoner of our, all these beliefs. So this this aspect, I don't think only by law, uh, this is uh, possible by the government. So so the solution is, it should as every solution, you know, this can be kind of this is what normally said. It should start from the school. It should start from the home. It should start. I, when I went to UK, thanks to the Chemnick Scholarship, what I learned about gender sensitivity, sensitivity is from my child, they were given her 25 tasks to do and she pasted in her home in the UK school. One of Most of the tasks is about don't judge people on the hat colors. Um, I mean, most are touching uh, how everybody, men and uh, women are equal. So they, uh, you have to greet, you have to smile every day for five. So such things that have started in third standard, fourth standard. So we are we doing such things. So we, I don't know whether law can do this. So catching them young in the families, in the childhood, uh, I think that can be one kind of solution. I, don't, I know I have not answered you, Arjun. No, no, you have. You have. I order. think you said it, catch them Probably. young. And that, that's something I think everyone on the panel believes it. And as we speak, you catch Nirvana. them young, but the catch government them. has to be mindful about the curriculum, about the things the school teaches to the child. That has to be in conjunction with the parenting position parents teach. See, we have not have got any parenting lessons to the parents. We think we automatically become parents, but parenting is a skill to be learned that hasn't been taught neither by the government nor by other people. So there is a very big lack when we say catch them young and the home would be the case. The home would be actually teaching the wrong thing, the gender inequality. And Malam uh, Morgan, I understand your predicament. Government makes laws in India, but doesn't see the implementation. The mm. implementation wise, India is one of the poorest countries. That is why the laws which are good on paper, 
are not implemented, like pop too, for example. Absolutely. And as we speak, 12 million girls, I, I love data. As we speak, 12 million girls each year get married between the age below 18. So roughly 33,000 per day, which means for the last half an hour or 45 minutes that we have been speaking, every one or two seconds, somewhere in the world, a girl child below 18 got married. And that's a reality. Yeah. I will have to conclude this, but I will leave uh, ask all my guests, with, leave them with one minute to wrap up their thoughts. And I'll start with Bala Murugan. Uh, so after which Professor Goswami and then Dr. Bhadra. Yes, Mr. Bala. Uh, men and women are supposed to be complementary, but it is so unfair, it is hierarchical. So th this is not fair. And uh, a simple compassion, a simple thinking, a compassion in a family, uh, even it, it starts from a simple compassion. That's what I want to say. And lastly, I want to again summarize, we country like India, such a large population with so much poor people, more than the entire African continent has, we cannot afford to lose this one to two trillion dollars. It is economic sin. This two point I want to say and conclude. Thank you. Professor Goswami, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, you know, it's very difficult to sum up what I want to say in a minute, I think. Uh, um, yes, I agree that there are laws and there is poor implementation and everything cannot be addressed through law. It hardly can be addressed through policies. What we need is ungendering uh, right from our childhood. And that is something that we all need to learn. There needs to be curriculum for parents, for students, everything. Um, also on the point of gender neutrality, because I think there were a lot of questions on whether Indian soaps and marital uh, of rape of men and things like that. You know, we need to work on, on um, very narrow grounds in the sense that at times we need to be gender neutral. And at times we need to be gender sensitive and the two can't go together. You know, we can't say that, you know, our workspace is gender neutral, you know, everybody can come in because by gender neutrality, you still have a standard that that's going to be the male standard. So trans people and women will not get into the workspace. So similarly for laws, we also need to figure out whether a domestic violence laws or rape laws need to be gender neutral. There have been debates on this. And I think we need to tread the ground into sensitivity and and neutrality you know when we talk about how men can also be you know facing violence of course we are not denying so we need to get we need to relearn what is masculinity but we also need to understand that the nature of violence that is inflicted on women and third gender is very different from the way it's it's done on men uh, so we also need to be gender sensitive at times we haven't entered into an era of complete neutrality when we would enter that we would not have to even talk about gender one day dr bhadro your last thoughts okay uh, two points one is that we start thinking ourselves as individuals that way we are not men or women or transgender or anything we are individuals and we should actually talk about individuality how to actually cultivate the culture of individuality everywhere consider every person on their activities not what their biological organ is or what they're looking like and what dresses they're wearing second point is that government of india can do one thing policy wise making compulsory gender edit gender audit will be should be compulsory in every institution and every time a report should go and that should go through media publicly and media should come in favor of this the gender audit should be performed in every from every school to every small uh, uh, shop then we know that what is actually happening lot we do not know what happens behind the screen remember ncrb national crime records bureau of india has said we only catch 20 to 25 percent of the time officially reported data 75 percent go long so let's stop being men and women can we be individuals absolutely maybe yeah, absolutely in the end of this uh, uh, you know or beginning of the 21st century thank you so much dr bhadro professor goswami 
and mr balamurugan thank you so much for such enlightened such an enlightened conversation you know i learn every day i am very happy that the audience had a lot of young fresh minds uh, people who are 18 19 20 22 23 20, and i am sure we our, our politicians boast of a young country uh, 130 crore ke andar 35 people below 35 are huge i am sure this is the audience this is the crowd which will make india a better country which will shape the future and if they start participating in conversations like this where we have an exchange of ideas and opinions einstein's remember that read that book as well and i keep saying that uh, if we have an exchange of ideas and opinions from eminent scholars on a weekend afternoon evening uh, nothing can be more fulfilling than this i wish all of them good luck if they apply for the chevening scholarship it's life changing mind you and most importantly focus also on the travel part of it we saved a lot of money bala myself we we had plans of trekking to ben nevis and all of that we traveled to scotland it's fascinating but you know they also push you and make you study like hell so study is important you just don't go there to have fun but indeed you go there to prick your own bubble to understand a bigger world it's also a country which takes criticism which takes counter arguments many of you have read mr tharoor's book seen the oxford union debate but beyond all of that it is also a country the uk and their relationship is one such where you have the liberty to express your opinion and form a global community where you can shape the future i will leave it to that i once again thank my senior chevening scholars eminent panelists friends and the members of the audience thank you ajita menon she has been the backbone of all of this thank you sophie ross thank you supriya chawla for your insight your presentations as i hand it over to the snu authorities i thank them as well for hosting this back to you ms bose thank you can we have a photo session with the panelists please listen we are already missing out on the coffee and the sandwiches so <laughs> on the virtual medium uh if this is an incentive i Aud hope audience this... may we have your videos on please just for a, a simple photo session if possible and if of course the bandwidth permits can i uh, request ajita to you know like join for the photo supriya ajita ma'am everyone please uh bala my video is having a problem so never mind maybe next time but i want all of you to switch on your videos and i hope ina is taking the photo okay aruna bo if you are online please switch on your video aruna bo is not i don't know i can't see him just take whatever you have and uh, a very big thank you to the audience who have been very very participative and uh, you know interactive and and also been patient to sit through the whole thing and i really hope some of them will at least apply for the chevening scholarships and fellowships in future over to you ina for the vote of thanks yes i think i should uh, give a formal vote of thanks but uh, definitely it was a insightful session very very engaging and hats off to the audience large number of them have entered and a large number of them couldn't uh, reasons not known to me probably it's a week day and uh, unlike myself people are going to work there are people who are going to work i know some of my colleagues here uh, they are still traveling back home they are in the vehicles and from there they are trying to access so we have to consider all that but the entire program uh, is going live on youtube and facebook so later on also those who couldn't join will be able to access it my gratitude <coughs> to sophie ross my gratitude to supriya chawla and um, of course this panel was uh, the moderator hats off to you arjun Uh, I've never met you in person. I've heard a lot about you. Uh, it was a real 
Thank great so work much. that you have done today. I'm sure we will post the pandemic. Uh, Ruchira, an old friend of mine. Uh, I've been knowing her since ages. But uh, Mr. Balamurugan, this was a uh, first time acquaintance with you. Hope to meet you in person sometime, sometime later. Uh, of course, the entire thing wouldn't have been possible without the support of Dr. Bula Bhadro. Um, I can call her my mentor. I don't know. Maybe she's my mentor. <laughs> and I consider her to be so. And uh, uh, Mr. Oruna Bhattacharya, he has been uh, pushing me, poking me, making me change things, uh, um, design the entire uh, today's session. Thank you, uh, Arun. And my dear friend, old friends, Borna and Ajita. Borna, we have been uh, meeting after a long time. And Ajita, of course, uh, these are the two people who have uh, uh, helped me to, uh, what to say, to make a dream come true this session. Thank you, Ajita. Thank you, Borna. Borna, is she there? I can't see her. Oh, she has no, Borna there. had to leave. Uh, Borna had to leave. She sends her apologies and okay, uh, she also mind, thanked you mind. for the session. And yeah, thank you, Ina, for Arun. all the help and support and the excellent team that you have in SNU. And also yes, to your my colleagues, who uh, who attend my the session. So, Imrila and Himadri, they are my backbones. I wouldn't have been able to do this without them. And they had been to work. Coming back from work and then starting the session was really, uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Arjun. Thank you, thank so you much, Ajita. Well. Can we call you. it a day? Thank, thank you all. Bye-bye. And hope to have more such further sessions True. in future. And uh, the, the topic was such, Ajita, uh, the, the time, it was inadequate. We Absolutely. We should needed, think, uh, think of specific issues henceforth and try and do something like this in a, on a more frequent basis. Yeah, sure, sure. Think of, uh, I mean, get ideas. Let's do things. And well, thank you, audience, who are still logged on. I can see that there are still 65 participants who are logged on to this. Thank you very by much. By the way, we had around 260 odd uh, registrations. So I'm sure they are going to join later on on YouTube and uh, Facebook channels. Well, I hope that uh, our ties with uh, BCL and Shivaning got uh, strengthened when I see our students are getting Shivaning scholarship. I'll hope and uh, <clears throat> wait for that with Abitant Way. We hope Thank your you students much. will apply for it, Dr. Bhadro. Uh, I hope so too. Thank you. And, Ina, I just wanted to add some of our very senior and also very recent uh, Chimning alumni joined in the, you know, joined in as participants and they have been very active on, on the chat box. The chat. And I just Great. wanted to let you know that and also like to thank them for their uh, support for this event. And uh, Ajita, uh, 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 I think them. I should mention that um, the schools under Techno India group a uh, number of teachers and some of the principals have also joined in today. Fantastic. <coughs> that that is all across the state. They are all eligible for applying for evening. So please like tell them they should look at the application process, which is now open uh, at our website and see if they can apply uh, for the scholarships or fellowships right. which are on offer. Right. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank Good you. night. Thank Have you. a nice Good day. Night. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye. Nadi. Bye everybody. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye ma'am. Ruchira. Nice to see you, Ruchira. Bye. Yes. Quite a pleasure, <coughs> huh? Imagine, <coughs> but that's great. Okay, that's great. great. I hope I succeeded as your student. Hopefully. Oh, yes. Of course. You <laughs> do. Of course. By all students succeed. <laughs> that is the, what I will say. Bye now. Bye. Bye, Rajita, ma'am, Arjun. Bye, Bala. Bye, Bala. Bye, Bala. Bye, bye, Ruchira. Bye, Arjun. Pro professor, ma'am. Bye, Professor Bhadro. Bye, Ina. Bye, 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 Bye,